that I'm sitting is uh, really the the applications grant applications are are rated also and there's really good emphasis on uh, what will be the clinical translation of um, any uh, sort of hypothesis or a question you're testing. This has been um, more and more the case, uh, which is which is really promising, I think. Uh, but of course, it, it really depends uh, also on the point of view of the reviewing panel or um, some of the historical understanding of what a fundamental science should be. Um, and I totally agree that the real world and um, highly controlled laboratory experiments are two different things. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with everything that's been said. And I also think that like there's a, um, just to comment on this point about what's like new new and shiny is is exactly what a PhD should be. It's gonna be innovative, but just to resonate, not, not just the practicality, but actually from like, and you know, Amy, you can comment on this more being, being a general partner in a venture capital firm. But if I come out there and I say, I've got this radical thing that no one's ever seen in the world and I don't know if it's gonna work, but you know, it's amazing and new, like a lot of venture capitalists are like, okay, great, come back in three years, you know, prove it out first. In some senses, like the thing that will raise money is the thing that's not radically different from what came before, but generates a lot new, a lot of new value through some tweak, you know. If I take a toothbrush and make a sonic toothbrush, you know, it's still a toothbrush, everyone understands it's a toothbrush, and now I can sell a lot more of this better toothbrush. But if I come and say there's no toothbrush at all and it's some gear you got to put on and it like puts lasers into your teeth and people have to orient around it, then there's a question, will anyone use it? Will they adopt it, right? So I just think that that calibration is, is really, really important to understand. The, the and even when you come out of a lab and you're kind of thinking with that mindset of newest will always sell, the reality is often very far from that. Um, so that does speak again to like bringing in the... Uh, the kind of design thinking very early on, like, will anyone use this if I build it? <laughs> um, and it's not always that if you build it, they will come. Sometimes it just sits there for 20 years, um, even though it, it is actually transformative. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, and by the way, that shouldn't be to say that, um, that there are not those cases where there's both incredible innovation and it's a total breakthrough. And I think this we're seeing some of those applications in the neurotech space now, you know, that are really exciting and seeing people adopt truly breakthrough things that have never been done before and venture capitalists putting money into it is really encouraging, but it's not the norm necessarily. Um, the other thing I'd say is that um, for the translational part of it, like there, there is a ton of innovation happening in academia that is actually very translatable and very usable in industry. Algorithms are being written in labs every day. Data is being produced by the terabytes, the petabytes in various clinical trials and stuff everywhere. But like very little of that is being, is, is accessible outside of the kind of inner sanctum and the, the affiliated industry partners and so, you know, I mean, I, when I founded Intheon, the whole point was like, how do we make a platform that is the thing academics would use, but also the thing that industry could use is built for an industry company to use too. And it's got all the things in it that an industry partner would want, but also something an academic would want. So really both parts of the system are working together in the same ecosystem. And I think that kind of thinking is still something we need to, to advance further on. You know, we have not solved all the problems there and how you make that language work for everybody, but we've tried to make a step towards that. And I would love to see more, more of that thinking. And then standards are absolutely critical to that. <laughs> you know, it's the boring thing, you know, and some of us have sat on many standards committees. I know you have Amy and others. I see some faces here, uh, but, you know, it's a, uh, it's a really painful and boring thing that absolutely has to be done if we want for this translational stuff to work. The file formats that academics use to store their data, you know, may not be the thing that interoperates with what an industry partner who's home rolled their own file format is going to be able to work with. So, you know, why do we not just have one file format that everybody uses and we can just stop talking about, you know, is your data compatible with my software? <laughs> like this should just be done 10 years ago. But these are the things that I think we can solve. It's very solvable. We just all have to get around a table and agree on these specifications and, and everyone has to agree, the academics too, you know, 
So I'm really excited about um, some of the efforts that IEEE has been making there. Um, definitely IEEE Brain pushing that forward to the Consumer Electronics Association was getting into this. We were working on standards with them um, and we did manage to roll out a consumer EEG file format through them. That was ANSI, but but yeah, you know, this is happening, but we need more people behind yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm curious if, if any of the other panelists have comments on, on the standards piece, because that does seem to me to be sort of one of those things that's an enabling connector right between it's it, like you said it's very unsexy right um Super. but it but it is it is one of the things that does in in some ways allow that crosstalk between um academia and industry and and how is that other other than um you know the the good efforts of IEEE brain and others are there ways to incentivize that and how have other communities done that in the past in a way that that has that has that have pulled people in so there's the neurodata without border um, efforts, which is actually geared towards creating a standard for neuroscience data across scales as a species. It's had some success, I would say, but it hasn't been uniformly adopted in all labs. I think like every lab is kind of comfortable with their, their own data and file format. And um, it, it's basically definitely a barrier um, that has to be crossed. As again, as somebody who develops methodologies uh, and then has to test them on data sets, I actually have various collaborators and each one of them has a different data format and I, I work with all of them. So, I mean, I'm kind of used to it, but I, but I agree in order to make it more uh, seamless, we need standards for data. Um, and it's not just data, also it's kind of um, devices, right? It seems like, as you said, there's all these startup companies that are spun up and each one of them has a different device. And I'm sure the device has different specs and can support different operations. And then so, so if you build a methodology that is actually generalizable across multiple conditions, whether then you're, you're building a neuromodulation device for depression or for Alzheimer's or chronic pain or whatever it, is, it may be. There's a lot of methodologies that we develop that could potentially be extend, but each device will have different specifications. So having some sort of, I don't know, standards also for sort of medical devices that then can support software and having those compatible would really help. But there is, as far as data standards, the best that I know of is the Neurodata Without Border effort okay. um, that has had some success in signing up experimental labs into it. Great. Any others on the panel want to want to jump in on standards before I? Yeah. Shift so, yeah. so just to, to pick up on um, I think what Ted mentioned earlier. So IEEE does actually have a, a standards committee, and they do a lot of uh, a really good work. Um, I think it's difficult to know how much uptake there is uh, an adoption by industry of the work they do. So that's sort of a question mark and, and maybe they're not really incentivized to uh, freely um, uh, sort of announce what, what they're using, what they're not using. So, so there, I think there is that challenge on the academic side. What you see is um, a proliferation of publishing of protocols, which I think helps, uh, but there are still so many out there. So if you look at it from like the device fabrication um, you know, involving nanofabrication, there are so many different protocols out there and what will work in one facility may not work in yours. So even though there is an effort to share more, um, it's not necessarily portable from one facility to another. So that, that's also uh, problematic. Right. I mean, yeah, I, no. oh, go ahead. No, please. You, you've... Uh, I agree. I, I think this uh, standard format is quite challenging. And let me give you an example. I mean, we are doing uh, from sleep field, we are doing uh, sleep studies. And in this day and age, we are still sitting down and scoring every 30 second of an eight hour recording and assigning them a sleep stage. The reason the automatic sleep scoring uh, did not uh, sort of become the standard by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine is one of the reasons is the, basically the challenge of having different devices and different data formats. So, so the testing and validity could not be done across the board in wide data sets. Uh, there's a really nice uh, outstanding effort um, uh, at, with an open source software available online is a national uh, sleep data resource 
And uh, similarly, in that, the same challenge is there. You know, the, the backup is to use the European data format, so to speak, to, to export the data. But, but other than that, I think it still remains to be a challenge. So we're practically 1960s in terms of how we handle sleep studies, which is, in a way, uh, tells you the story, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I was, <clears throat> Miriam, you mentioned um, algorithms. And one of the things I was thinking that's kind of, it's it's not quite a standard, but it still should be portable is, is the, the, the notion of taking um, certain algorithms or, you know, whether you want to call them metrics or uh, different measures and, and porting those from system to system. It sounds like you've been doing some of that with some of your collaborators. It, when, when will the day come that I can uh, buy a, a couple of uh, cognitive uh, algorithms off the shelf and, and you know, not, not have to, you know, sort of build those from scratch over and over again? I think you can get them off the shelf from our lab's GitHub today, but the problem is if you want to download it into your implantable device and have it do something, then there's a problem, right? So I feel like as far as the algorithms for, for offline, like, so basically just doing it on, a, on your computer go, you can do that today. I mean, we, we have GitHub, we actually do, we put a lot of effort into making our uh, code structures for research purposes available. Uh, to, to the to, to researchers in the field, but the, the problem is if you actually want it to run on a medical device, um, there are all these constraints with the processing on chip that you have to take into account, like how much computation power, how much power, how much computation you're allowed. And I feel like that is the link that would make it for clinical purposes uh, relevant. And that's the link that's been difficult for us um, to see how we can establish. Got it. Tim, you've done work in the past on, on sort of, let's call it maybe, you know, through through your work at Intheon, standardizing some of some of the algorithmic measures that that may be, you know, kind of more typical, less associated with a medical device, perhaps, and more in terms of a, an applied neurotechnology. What what are your thoughts there? How how has how has that approached? widening acceptance or, or accessibility? Yeah, uh, so definitely um, a big part of our vision and mission at Intheon has been exactly this question of all the things that people want to do, both in academia and in industry, is there in that kind of Venn diagram, is there kind of an overlapping core of processes that everybody ultimately wants to do and should be done well um, and should be done in a way that's essentially replicable, standardized, you know, if, if you if you want to do a spectral transform and I want to do, do a spectral transform, why should we be using radically different ways of doing that? Can we not just agree on the, the method that we use a multi-taper or something? So this is like from a signal processing perspective. You can extend that out to just entire workflows. When you pre-process your data and I pre-process the data, are we doing the same thing? Are we doing radically different things? If we both do the same thing, then at least we can know that that amount of variability is excluded and there's more shareability of that pre-processed data because we both can agree on what has happened to the data. So the first step that we've really focused on at Intheon is how do we take a lot of those common steps that everybody has had to go through? I mean, we've taught, I've taught so many EG lab workshops, it's hard to now remember over all these years, but the amount of questions, this is surprising how many, it's the exact same question year after year after year after year. People, ultimately it's the same different problems being solved, but ultimately at the bottom of all of that is the same, is a very highly overlapping set of challenges that different people are trying to, to break through, to get through. And I found that in industry, it was the same thing. The questions people were actually asking in industry was actually very similar to what academic PhD students were asking at some level. So yeah, what we've been trying to do is put the answers to those questions in algorithmic form in workflows that are validated, standardized, replicable, and either maybe it's not 100% of what you need, but it's 80% of it. And you can customize the remaining 20% to your needs. And for some people, it's just turnkey. You press a button, in goes your data, out comes your paper. That's actually kind of the goal. Um, uh, automatically generate your paper. Um, we won't write all the all the discussion section yet. GPT-4 will do yeah, that. Yeah, that's what GPT-3 is for, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, that's a, but, but there is a there is a realistic path to this. It may seem kind of silly, but it's a, there's a realistic path to be able to automate a big chunk of this 
So that fundamentally the process of the science is asking quite intelligent questions as opposed to like writing Python code for like how you do your filtering. Um, and that's what we're trying to innovate on here. And I think for industry, that's proving to be very helpful to them too, because that's essentially they have a question they want answered and don't want to spend years trying to like implement, you know, the right way to get an answer to that question. Um, the other thing I'll just say is the standard stuff we've been doing in general at Intheon has cross cut a lot of different projects. Um, one project we've been heavily involved in is the lab streaming layer. Uh, Mariam, I think you mentioned interoperability of hardware or and things like that. Um, this has been something that has uh, really been on our mind for a long time. How do you plug and play different devices together? In fact, how do I plug and play with any device where I can just take off the shelf a commercial de uh, a commercial device built by some vendor and build my algorithms on it? And LSL tries to solve that problem for about 114 devices today and allows you to synchronize their data. It doesn't matter the sampling rate, doesn't matter the type of device as eye trackers, heart rate monitors, implants, all kinds of devices. Um, but it standardizes the way you acquire the data, the metadata, and the synchronization of the data. So uh, Ashke says LSL is great. So we have one, one uh, fan. That's awesome. Thank you, mm -hmm. Ashke. Um, yeah, so, so that's a project. And, um, and then another one is the XDF file format. I'm just shouting out a few things that might be useful to people. But this is a file format that has really tried to be the thing that can work for academics and industry because it's designed for multimodality. It's designed to have all the metadata you need stored with your file. So there's not like an additional Excel file somewhere that's got all your event markers or another file somewhere that's telling you what the sampling rate was. Everything's in there. And it, it actually is an ANSI standard for consumer um, EEG called the uh, attuned container format. It's XDF, you know, with frills. Um, so those are two things. And then I'll shout out about bids. We didn't do bids, but everybody should check out bids. Um, it's a phenomenal uh, containerization standard, uh, which really is answering the question of how do I share my entire study with someone else? And they'll know what I did, which is a big problem. I share my data with you. And you're like, oh, I don't know. What did you actually do here? What was the actual event? What was the experimental paradigm? Bid solves that problem very beautifully. Thank you. Got a couple shout outs for LSL in the in the chat, uh, you know, which is which is <laughs> great. Uh, you know, definitely, definitely have have used it myself. I have sort of one more, um, you know, one more question, perhaps, and then um, let's let's open it up for larger questions. I know we want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, you know, you, you know, sort of this past year, um, I participated in a workshop uh, called the Cleveland Neurodesign Workshop, where uh, we brought in um, folks, obviously, from regulatory, venture funding, uh, clinical design, uh, you know, even, you know, access to, to large um, compute and, and cloud computing, and used a very much a design thinking approach to help um, students, essentially, you know, those either graduating with their PhDs or clinicians, MDs, who are interested in kind of bridging that perhaps entrepreneurial gap. But as you mentioned, Tim, using sort of a design thinking approach, I can certainly assure you that, at, you know, in my in my seat now as a venture capitalist, <laughs> see plenty of hammers looking for nails and get really excited when companies have done the homework to uh, make the connection back to, um, you know, the clinician and, and the patient's needs. Um, this came up as a theme as well. So I wanted to hit on this last before we opened it up. What, what are some methods that you have seen that are successful for um, kind of bringing the clinician and patient focus into the development of some of these technologies, which will indeed make them sustainable, I think, through that? Or um, if you haven't seen any examples of that, uh, maybe offer some, some suggestions so that folks who might be designing some of these interactions or programs might, might find those insights useful. I'll offer one example. So the uh, National Science Foundation started a program probably more than 10 years ago called Innovation Core. Um, and, you know, at the uh, heart of that program, the idea is that, you know, you can work on stuff, but that 
when you go out there and you try to sell it, maybe there's no one to buy. It. And, and, and the reason is your original hypothesis was wrong, right? Your original target customer is actually not your customer because the pain that you're trying to solve is not their pain. And so, um, you know, it, it funds academic researchers to essentially, you know, the word is to get out of the building and interview um, who, uh, different people who might actually be their customers, who might not, and actually look at their hypothesis for a potential market to see if, if it's a match or they need to take a different direction. Um, I think it's difficult to assess exactly what the impact is, but I'll say in my case, having been through it twice, um, it gave me um, some ability to actually go out and meet clinicians and to go out and meet patients where otherwise I wouldn't do so you know, in my job day to day as a professor. And so while it may not have been a successful um, effort for the thing that I was currently working on at the time, over time, it's actually changed my thinking about how, the questions I choose to actually do research on and the legwork I do before I launch a project. Yeah, that's great. Great insight. Thank you, Alice, for that. How about others? Um, Amy, I have a question for you, actually, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> So cool. uh, how about, um, you know, it was mentioned that this sort of, uh, I think Tim mentioned that breakthrough design and then uh, presented to a venture capitalists and, you know, there's no proof of concept or it wasn't well thought through, then it, it doesn't, you know, do a good uh, market success. Uh, are the venture capitalists more open to sort of an incremental advances, but then way more on the market value? Or, you know, how, how, how do you, from that end, how do they think that, you know, innovation is something, but then there's also the business aspect of it. How do they weigh the yeah, yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll speak for my group. I mean, obviously, there's there's a lot of different flavors, you know, of, of venture capital in terms of where they work along the risk spectrum, right? So right. you may find VC firms that are that are willing to to enter at what we call maybe that pre seed level, where there's still some science risk, uh, you know, left. Um, and, and, you know, somebody's willing to pay a little money to, to, to bridge what we, you know, used to call the valley of death, right, between non-dilutive funding and moving into venture capital funding. We, we tend to focus on the seed stage. And so um, at that point, some of the most or almost all of the science risk has been taken off the table. And now we're starting to do an engineering type solution, right? So I, I know the structures in the brain that I want to target. I kind of know the methodology that I want to use to target that in the case of something, maybe let's say related to neuromodulation. And then the bigger question is like, okay, the capital is going to go into, you know, building those prototype devices and then um, you know, obviously doing some of the initial, you know, studies or trials, whether that's still related to an academic environment, or maybe they've switched over to, you know, a, a, a CRO or, or something like that. I think the check sizes, you know, kind of like if somebody has a prototype and they're ready to kind of start doing things at maybe a low rate of production and get them into market, you might see a bigger check size there, right? Somebody might write them a th you know, three to $5 million check. I think if somebody has got the science done and hasn't built the device yet, you, you probably would find people who would be willing to write a one to $2 million check to at least get that device produced and, and see some, you know, like first, you know, clinical work at an IRB type, type level before taking it to the much larger discussion. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, I, by the way, you know, I've, I've spoken more recently at another IEEE conference. There's an incredible appetite for neurotechnology now. For those of us who have been doing this for a while, it's kind mm -hmm. of exciting. <laughs> We're starting to see um, people engage and not just um, folks who have traditionally funded medical research or medical work, not just clinical uh, 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 venture capital firms or something that might be the venture arm of a, of a medical, you know, like a GSK or a J&J, &J, which are still great. But now you're starting to see some of the deep tech firms, like we, I'm in a deep tech firm, it's pretty broad, um, but really getting engaged in, in neurotechnology. So I hope Thank that's you. helpful. Yeah. yeah, very helpful. Totally. Totally. Well, okay. So um, Gert, I want to open it up to the 
larger audience now, um, you know, as you say, please raise your virtual hand uh, <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to ask some questions. Uh, if there are questions uh, from the audience or Gert, certainly open it up to you if you have some something that you've been, uh, you know, uh, sort of wanting to wanting to throw into the conversation. Yeah, thank you. This has been great discussions. Thanks, Amy, and all the, the panelists. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> And so we have another several people in the among attendees who come both from academia and industry and, uh, and from the clinical uh, sector. And so I'm sure they will have uh, some great input. Uh, and so let's open up for for some some thoughts here. Okay. And while we wait, let me actually. Uh, so this is has been great. It's fantastic to to uh, have all this uh, those different uh, issues to to force to consider. And we live in this this strange world now, right? With COVID, um, we all uh, uh, get to experience what it is to uh, uh, how important health is and how much it can impact in everything that we do, and also uh, uh, the different kind of um, um, how neurotechnology or how technologies in general uh, can really impact what we do. Um, and so, so one question I have for, for all the panelists here, right? So uh, we have all these great technologies. In fact, uh, all of you are leaders and really very sophisticated in doing great technologies and also for clinical impact of, uh, of let's say, for sleep, um, and, um, et cetera. Um, and so, but so, so what can be done? Um, uh, what is the low hanging fruit uh, where um, technologists can really make an impact um, for a translation and not limited only to say this this latest gadget that you have uh, available in a in a um, acute care setting in hospital but uh, more generally right so for people just in every walk of life anywhere um, and uh, from any ranks of, right, of life so so what, what are your um, um what are your thoughts here I have a lot of thoughts about this. Yes, and I'm just I know. To I know. It. Was so, so yes. The, um, I mean, in the end, like the 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 arc that, that at least I've seen for neurotechnology has increasingly is is increasingly moving towards invisibility. I mean, this is the classic concept in ubiquitous computing of, you know, Mark Weiser's famous statement about you know the most profound technologies that which disappears into the fabric of everyday life until it's indistinguishable from it. So one of the big, big concerns that we've had to date with respect to, you know, to, to this issue that you're raising, you know, Gert of kind of, you know, high impact and high dissemination, et cetera, is, is, and with real impact is just how do you build a piece of technology that is both highly impactful, so it has real functional utility and is essentially unobtrusive and invisible. Um, part of that's an engineering problem. Part of it's a design challenge. And we've talked about design thinking a lot, and it's something that, frankly, I would love to personally see a lot more design thinking at very early stages to answer that question. But that's uh, that's that's something that's a challenge. But I'm encouraged by um, some of the recent innovations. I mean, obviously, the inv innovation in, in intracranial work has been really interesting because that's fundamentally how it disappears altogether. Um, and if we can get to a point where you can have a minimally invasive procedure, maybe it's a stentrode, maybe it's something else. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, some technology like neural dust, I don't know what it will be, where it is obtrusively implanted, I think we cross a huge, huge threshold. And the, the second thing is about how you can have a wearable technology that has high value to a person. And I've been working with wearable EEG for a long time, there's a lot of utility, but there's a lot that it will just never do. You know, you're never going to have a six degree of freedom neural prosthetic with a two electrode EEG system on your forehead. Well, you wouldn't put it on your forehead, but somewhere, <laughs> you know, so there's these limitations, right? But there is a category that I'm super excited about, which is neuromodulation, because with neuromodulation, you can have non-invasive wearables that write information to the brain, so to speak, or change circuitry and can have massively profound impact. Like bioelectronic medicine is the next, is the next wave of medicine in my view, I, I think for sure. And this is like something that today we have the capacity to deliver things and form factors that are scalable and that have that huge impact. So that's the one, anyway, I said I'd be brief, but I, I've not been brief, but that is the thing that I'm really interested in what people think about. What is the future of bioelectronic medicine, neuromodulation specifically? 
Yes, I, I have one comment that I'm hoping could be helpful to, to the rest of the panel and, and the audience is one of the transformation we clearly see happening in our clinical practices is the telehealth. So, uh, and one, one is really, really looking for, now it's, it's really uh, actively as we speak last week's or the week before his clinic schedule has been hybrid in major hospitals. So, so uh, one thing that clinicians would love to see in the future, that this doesn't just become a conference call, but you have access to patients uh, collected data that you would normally do that testing if you were to, if they were to walk into your clinic and, and capture that data. So, so that would be uh, really something that's gonna revolutionize how we, um, reach out to our patients, monitor them, uh, apply preventative medicine and interventions. Yeah. That's a great point. That's, that's really been a theme that I think has been, been coming up, especially in, in some of the discussions that we've been having, how can we pair, you know, mm -hmm. telehealth and telemedicine with some of these, you know, sort right. of more advanced, uh, technologies and certainly very excited about you know, sort of what, where, where that's headed. I think, I think that's what, you know, all of us are constantly looking for silver linings, right. From, mm -hmm. from this whole experience in, in COVID. And, and I do think that, um, you know, accessibility, even, you know, seeing people, obviously there's an ongoing mental health crisis now, but, but even the access to, um, therapies and mental health, um, through the telehealth platforms, I think has reduced a barrier to entry for, for many, um, which I think is a really important, um, a really important direction to be headed in, especially, you know, considering what's, what's happening now. Um, all right, I'll open it up to, uh, others. I see some people popped on their cameras, so I'm not sure if anyone wants to ask a question. Okay. I'm talking about yeah. this. Oh yeah. Daniel, go ahead. Please. Daniel, Daniel Gulick, would you like to share a question with us? Uh, yeah, just kind of thinking of the simplest version of what you were just talking about. Um, uh, Ezra. Sure. What's, what are the barriers for getting like, if you wanted to see the data from someone's Apple watch in the clinic, when you talk to them, what's the barriers with that? Well, data belongs to Apple. That's one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so that brings us to the point where we say better, uh, you know, crosstalk between industry and, and uh, academia or treating physicians and so on and so forth. Um, but also, I mean, I must say there has been some research out there, including top medical journals like JAMA that uh, published work on what we call big data. Uh, anonymously. Uh, however, what we are missing in there is uh, there is only uh, cherry picking of one component that the company agreed to share with yeah. you, but but you don't necessarily have the full phenotype uh, to, to be able to answer some of the important clinical questions. So I think that um, it will be uh, really great because the data is out there. That's the, the, the you know, it's being collected as we speak. But we, we don't, need a new don't device. necessarily have big access to that. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question to the general, to everyone. Like, how many of you, if you were to raise your hand, would want to see this kind of interactive? Uh, symposiums and, and talks between uh, multidisciplinary, um, you know, scientists from clinician, from engineer, students, um, you know, um, industry together having that sort of, or maybe it exists and I'm missing them, but, um, you know, having them more frequently available, more, more making it a little more of a standard um, would, would also help us to, to understand each other better. Yes, <laughs> I think I think you have a rousing, uh, a rousing, uh, a rousing agreement there. I, you know, that is, you know, finding ways to facilitate that and and even incentivize it is, I think, I think definitely right, right. definitely a challenge. Zoom now, right? Yeah, yeah, 
Exactly. That has been, again, one of my, one of my cheerful right. silver, silver linings right. from, from right. this. We can actually get, you know, 57 people in a virtual room from all these different disciplines, which is, which is fantastic and including, including across the globe. Um, do we have another question? Yes, I think so. Uh, not a question, just a comment. I think Esther made a good point. Uh, we always have clinicians and sometimes industry, healthcare industry leaders attending our conferences, not much. But lately, at least the IEEE MBS, we start focusing on having them, the form. Uh, recently, we organized industry leaders form. This is the first time ever in the history of our society. We have 28 CEOs, CEOs and the VP for research from GE to Medtronic's Abbott. And the four days we shared and we listened to them. Our goal was not only get them involved with our society, but also really guide the young people, uh, junior faculty, and also students because we are still training the people with a uh, 20th century mindset. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> most of our students, I'm a department chair at a small department. We have 18 professors, 400 undergraduates. When we have, for example, BME day, our students, they want to have industry people are coming to the meeting to speak. And, uh, our graduates, uh, last six months, we have a four new depart uh, new companies, spin-off companies are coming. So I think the entrepreneurship and healthcare innovations are really shaping up academics, industry, government, everywhere. So I think we will see this one. It's so helpful. We are going to have also another four day symposium with the uh, clinical people. Uh, I'm going to organize and it's almost everything is confirmed. So it's going to be very, very helpful. I think Amy was one of the speakers also at the healthcare yeah. industry, the panels and the focus was medical device innovation, digital health, biopharm industry, and the neurotech. Of course, the neurotech is still, it's, uh, if you look at the US before pandemic, spending for bioengineering research or biomedicine related research, $1.3 trillion. Majority is biopharm, but the medical devices somewhere 500, 600 billion dollars. The number one again, still orthopedic engineering, cardiovascular number two, and the number three neuro, but maybe next decade we will see that more and more neurotech industry uh, investing and also the uh, providing opportunities for the young people. Yeah, that's our goal. That's our goal. Uh, okay. Natish, I think you have a, a, a comment or question, yes? Yeah, so I will bring a little different opinion. Um, so universities have their goal, teach, educate, research, write grants, get famous, get Nobel Prize. And by the way, have a hobby of starting up a company, feel good. Uh, but not, you're not great at that part, but we try. Uh, the industry has another goal, right? Raise money go public quickly, get a product into the patient, hurry, hurry, hurry up, who cares about the papers and this and that. And I think uh, that realism is, is there if I just wanna be blunt about it. And therefore, where, how do we meet, right? How do we meet in between? Sure, we produce students that industry can hire and vice versa. Collaborative sponsored research is struggles along a little bit here and there. So there are two mechanisms, I think. One is of course, SBIR mechanism has been working. And I think if we can endorse support and continue to do that, a lot of early stage risk is reduced. And that mechanism lets get things out of the university of which some will succeed. And the second one, I think to specifics to neuro days and Amy to your point and your optimism that these are like hey days, right? We've been around long enough, me, me quite a bit longer. And oh my God, it just can't get better than this in this field. It was cardiac pacemaker defibrillator assist device 30 years ago, it's now for us. And NIH is playing a role. In those days, it made artificial heart happen. And today these, not just the brain initiative, but the neurotech. So they are now have, calls for Neurotech Harbor, Neurotech, I mean, Hub, 
like a hub like proposals uh, so that they essentially outsource incubation of companies and incubation of services to the company. That was a recent call in October, November. So I'm saying that luckily for us, NINDS and IBIB in particular are playing a very good role at a potentially meaningful level of funding. And I think that's the middle ground. Sorry, took long, but I just wanted to be blunt that I think we need to look for the middle. Yeah, for sure. And everybody needs to lean in, right? Yeah. So well, I mean, I think if they, you know, thank God that there was that two percent set aside to, so the SBR money, which means uh, GERT can spin off a company and I can spin off a company and so on. And then some will succeed, right? Some will scale up before they come to you. Who you are early stage before they go to the other people are late stage and away before afterward. Big market is established, no risk, no whatsoever. Give me the clinical trial, then Medtronic will come in. That's the reality, right? Yeah. So because of that. A university incubation is so early stage. And I think that's the role of, uh, thankfully, this SBR and NIH program. And I just wanted to give a shout out for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I get some hearts for the, for the, for the funding there. Um, <laughs> well, we have just a couple minutes left. I want to, if there's any other questions from the audience or maybe any other final thoughts from our panelists as we uh, come into our, our last few minutes together here. Amy, I think there's one more hand raised. Oh, Sumil, Jane, yeah, no. Do you have not, a question? Not, not me, but um, I'm seeing. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Yeah, I see. Maybe they are here. They're just, you know, giving us a high five. So. Oh, uh, okay. So I need to learn these. <laughs> any? So yes, yeah, so I'll I'll just open it up. Any other any other last thoughts from from the panelists on sort of some of the feedback we've we've heard and and some of the things we've shared today. Stay connected with IEEE and all the different neural and brain initiative. And Amy, you bring in the VCs and I think some of the others to Metin's point to bring company scientists, engineers, entrepreneur to our discussion. I think IEEE neural slash EMBS is very open to that uh, relationship. Yeah. It's been great. Edward, I think you have a question, yes? Uh, yeah, and not really a question, just to add a little perspective. Um, I'm with Mentalab. We do represent the manufacturer side of things. So the industry side that is very dependent on academia because that's who uh, the majority um, of our customers are. But um, in Europe, for example, there is a big movement in closing this uh, perceived gap between industry and academia in the way that a lot of the publicly available grant money actually do require um, pretty much any type of uh, academic group that is applying for the grant money to partner with at least two industrial partners who have the like other set of perspective, their bottom line is that it needs to be marketable and it still needs to be profitable. And they are also much closer to the consumer. So they can actually like represent the voice of the customer and somewhat uh, show a clear picture of the exact requirements that might be very different than the like, academic group might think from their perspective on. So okay. there is a movement that we are seeing in that way, but there is still a long ways to go. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Edward. But I just well, want to make a comment. Edward, yes. I think it's the, I serve as an advisor on multiple uh, EU projects. So companies are not contributing money. They are not putting anything on the plate, right? No, uh, the companies would get part of the grant money, but uh, to they actually get the money. Okay. be considered for the grant, you have to have industrial partners on the submission. Okay. Okay, perfect. So basically, they don't have uh, not much risk for them. They are also getting money from, it's good, I'm not criticizing, but the uh, real contribution will be, as Nitish pointed out, long term, it needs to be industry and university collaboration. Because if you look at the number of the patents, majority have been issued at the university level, the academic level. I'm still holding this one. I think it's the, they have to also, at least I'm talking about in the US, is expectation maybe the, in future, the collaboration also requires them uh, more and more to uh, financially also put something on the plate and the collaboration. 
There's one interesting news lately. Many uh, healthcare providers are shifting into the more healthcare innovation. And uh, I don't have, you don't have time right now to listen, but I attended two meetings and one of them is really the largest the healthcare providers and they, they are going to collaborate with our university very soon on the other issues. So there are uh, even, I'm talking about the in healthcare insurance companies are moving into the also the healthcare innovation area. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted, I do want to keep us on schedule. Gert, I'm going to turn it back over to you to, uh, to, to carry us into the next stage of the meeting. And I just really want to thank our panelists um, for their insights and thoughts. I think we, I think we had a really great representation um, of individuals across the spectrum. I hope I, I learned something. I hope everybody uh, had a chance to, to have some new thoughts here and look forward to seeing all of you uh, eventually in person, uh, but certainly in our, in our wonderful community that we're building here. So thank you very much, Gert. Thank you. And also let me give a special thanks. Uh, thanks, Amy, for joining the, the panel, leading it. And in fact, uh, you have been very instrumental in starting this neurotechnology enterprise, right? As a DARPA manager, I remember that this was a great uh, mm -hmm. starting the seeds of this effort and the small companies that were able to- We're getting it. there. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. Thank you, Gert. I appreciate that. Okay, okay very good. So now we have, uh, in a few minutes, uh, we'll have a um, the, the uh, IEEE brain panel that'll be uh, starting. Um, and we probably take we'll take a, about a five minute uh, break so we can set uh, in the meantime we can set up uh, uh, that panel and uh, so that uh, panel will be led by uh, Terry Sinovsky. Uh, so we have a, a five minute break now. And we'll open up the break the breakout rooms again, just if anyone wants to roam around. Just a couple minutes. So you, you didn't actually channel Misha, did you? Misha Pavel. Uh, Misha is here. Oh, uh, yes, Michelle. How are you, Misha? Wonderful. I haven't seen him for a long time. And you're muted, uh, Misha. Would you like to share the slides on your end, Terry? Uh, I don't have any slides. Okay, okay. so now I can do that on my side. The here. panel, isn't it the panel? The panel, yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the panel slides, yeah. Oh, oh the panel slides. I know, I, I, what, if, if you want to put those up, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put them up, that's fine, perfect. Okay.
Good day. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Good. Wonderful to see you. I'm doing fine. <laughs> yes. We, we miss you. I know. You have not invited me, though. <laughs> To where? I mean, if you if if you're brave enough, if you want to fly to Houston, you're always welcome. Well, I'm 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 trying to be brave, you know, but uh, need to be careful. Yeah, we also traveled one internationally, one domestic flight we had. Oh, Last I, I went months. to Portugal. I went to Portugal in the summer, twice. And uh, I was there in the right time, you know, so it was very enjoyable. Okay. It's, uh, I think it's right now is more Europe is closing more and more, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now it's a nightmare. Yeah, well, I think this winter will be tough, but I, hopefully... Hi, Jose. Spring will be much better. Hi. Hi, Nitish. How are you? Nitish. Good to see you. I, I appreciate that you're using this pandemic to become an artist. Uh, that's great. Oh, yeah. I, that's my favorite uh, Portuguese painter. Okay. So, well, you know, I did visit Portuguese for the European, this, you know, in Porto and everywhere else. But good. We, we got out and then we had this meeting in San Diego with Metin. So yeah. it, it is uh, concerning to travel, so. Yeah, anyway. I know, that's a problem. Yeah, that's good, and I hope- uh, Omicron is gonna solve it, you know. He is going to infect everybody on earth, you know, so then we can, we can just take it as a, uh, a flu, right? That, that is my discussion flu. with uh, sort of half serious people in India, and which, because those countries have so much infectious environment, you just can't do this and the cost wise and so on do multiple level of this and the, the booster. And so it's the best in the end is self immunity. And so the question is how do we get there, right? So maybe a low level infection or anything and it just resilience builds up. Uh, that's a sort of pseudoscience. It will not go here, but uh, you know, we, we just can't keep on doing vaccination at multiple rounds for every small variation. Yeah. And the that's virus right. is going to keep on mutating. So, which means that that's every true. mutation is the point of the mutation is to escape, right? And therefore, I think the only immune system has what it takes to be multifaceted. But you know, the the the, the goal of a, of the perfect virus is to infect everybody and kill none, right? <laughs> that no, is true. Remember that. No, no, you, <laughs> that you're is, right. That is the. The, no, no. This guy is progressing towards that, like the other virus, you know. No, the, the SARS virus, that's what happened. flu and things like that. So we are getting in the right perspective, you know. Right. You're right, actually. The Ebola and SARS do the exactly that. Ebola is too little. There's not so few people, and then it dies off. And SARS was was spreading, but it was not lethal, and therefore it pretty much got out, go, went away. And this one is in the middle. Yeah. So, we, you know, if it becomes at the point level of mutation where it's just another flu vaccine, that's what people at Hop Hopkins or at least in Singapore are saying that it's going to become an endemic situation as opposed yeah. to a pandemic. And it'll be part of our cocktail of vaccination, like flu vaccine exactly. um, in years to come, which means. It happened that before, right? The Spanish flu kind of uh, mutated into the, the normal flu, right? Exactly. Sure. I mean, and this Omicron is, is, is in that direction, right? It infects much more and there's less lethal. So I think that we okay. are progressing in the right direction. You know, so is it but the reason that still you have this we'll get it's it. more desperation from the virus, right? I mean, so <laughs> yes. the more and more people, uh, the variants coming uh, because virus is trying to survive. Each time new variants comes, they strength they actually becomes more weaker, but they spread faster. Yeah. So well, I'd the, like to welcome everybody to the COVID panel. <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry we are public oh my goodness this is not i thought oh, it was uh, also recording also too right i mean okay good. all right oh yes thank, thank you terry for uh why don't you give it the final word on covid uh yeah. your next you're in sock you probably have the answer <laughs> yes uh get vaccinated early and often <laughs> <laughs> 
Sean oh. Rexy for polio. That was a, a real success back in the 50s. Okay, so most people, most of the population out there don't remember what a scourge it was, but it was really serious. It was devastating because it didn't kill people as much as it just, you know, really had a very, very serious uh, problems with uh, everything from moving to breathing and, uh, and you know, it was lifelong. Okay, should we start, uh, Gert? Do you wanna introduce the panel? Yes, Terry doesn't need an introduction, right? So Terry, yes, you're in charge. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Gert. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the, uh, uh, both at the Salk Institute and at UC San Diego, um, I'm the faculty of both places. But uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to uh, chair this panel, uh, which is entitled Melding Mind and Body in the Age of the Brain. And I'm reminded that uh, the first Mind Brain Institute was uh, at the Johns Hopkins University back in the 80s. Uh, and I was there, so I, I saw it uh, being created. And um, I'm not sure, is it still running? Uh, maybe uh, Nidish knows the answer to that. Uh, is, uh, does Hopkins still have a mind brain institute? Yes. Okay, it good. Is. Okay, well, we have one too. So <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the only one. We have a Kavli Institute for Mind and Brain, uh, the uh, Institute for Brain and Mind, KIBM. So it's a little bit different for me to the two, but the, what's new here is the body. And I think this is really important that we add uh, the body as an important player. And uh, I want to remind everybody that the brain is actually a subset of the body. You know, it's a part of the body, you know, which means that it, 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 it's, it's a complex organ of itself and, and an incredible complexity. And so really, uh, we have to include that whenever we think about mind and, and brain. So uh, I wanna start first with a, uh, just to make a brief announcement that the Misha Mehowal Prize for Neuromorphic Engineering this year, uh, Misha was uh, a neuromorphic engineer, uh, graduated from Caltech uh, working, uh, PhD was under Carver Mead and she, and she developed silicon, uh, analog silicon chips for vision and, and stereo. And, uh, and she died prematurely. Uh, she, she was, uh, and, and she was on the cover of nature with a, a silicon model of a neuron, Hodgkin Huxley neuron. So, you know, this, she was really way ahead of everybody else. But I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up, the prize for 2021 has been awarded to two groups. There's one, which is a team uh, and this is a project that started at Telluride, a uh, neuromorph neuromorphic uh, cognitive engineering workshop. It's, going, it's been going for like over 25 years, every year, every summer for three weeks. Um, and the prize there goes to a group that developed an auditory attention task for people with uh, hearing impairments. And so the idea is in a crowded room where there's a lot of noise uh, that by putting EEG and having the person just attend to a person on the left or the right, you can then boost up the signal to noise from that person. And, and this now is in a commercial product. So that was, that was that's a really, a, 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 I think a major uh, interface, you know, using the brain to control the input to the auditory system. The, the, the second team, uh, which was a team that uh, was working on a bionic arm, and so what they did was to tap into the motor neurons in the stump and then attach them to the uh, a, a prosthetic arm hand so that you could then, the person could learn how to control the arm. And what's remarkable about that, uh, by the way, this, this, this was a group, uh, let's see, it was, uh, well, uh, I think it was at, Oh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna guess. But in any case, it's a neuron paper that was published uh, 2018. Um, but what was, was remarkable was that the person who had this bionic arm, and they learned how they had to learn how to uh, use it. But they, once they did, they could pick things up, they could place them, they can grab things. But they they said that it felt as if it was their own arm, and that was because they had touch sensors on the hand 
which then were connected up to the sensory nerves, right? So it was a, it was a complete feedback loop. And, and remarkably, the brain adapted to that arm. It felt as if the arm was itself a part of the body. And I think that's very profound in the sense that the brain can actually incorporate not just the existing body, but uh, parts that are added to the body. Okay, so we now uh, that uh, I want to, to go around the panel and everybody to briefly introduce themselves. And uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Jose. All right. So my name is Jose Principe. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me. I'm professor at uh, in the ECE and biomedical engineering at the University of Florida. I've been working with brain signals for for 45 years. It's difficult to say the number, you know. But uh, so I I have uh, and it was a, a great choice when I started because. The brain signals were, you know, made me innovate a lot of signal processing because they are so difficult to, to really characterize. And so this, I think it was a great combination and for the young generation that is listening to us, I think that this is a great area to do advanced signal processing work uh, for good causes. Uh, thank you, Jose. So Metin. Hi. Uh, Metin Akai, I am actually, I'm the president of IEEE Engineering Medicine Biology Society. Also, I am the founding chair at the University of Houston of Biomedical Engineering Department. Uh, Research-wise, uh, we have been working on more the addiction and also uh, we are working on also cancer-related research. But I want to go to the addiction. Uh, in our lab, we uh, look at the genomics level, the uh, dopamine neuron, how the uh, gene pathways, gene regulatory networks changes in response to uh, drug abuse. Also, systemic level, we also record the extracellular activities. And the, with the, jointly with Japan, we have developed the CMOS implantable, and we are looking for imaging. And I think the future to look at the more behavior to go from genomics level to systems level and all the tissue cellular level to go to the uh, more the behavior. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Jan? Hi, um, Jan Rabai. Um, I'm a faculty, kind of semi-retired faculty at the University of California at Berkeley. And I'm also these days connected with IMEC in, in Belgium. So uh, the way I got into the brain was primarily uh, kind of looking at um, low power. Low power was kind of a driver of a lot of things I've been doing. And one of the uh, interesting areas I found was how can we build actually very small interfaces to neurons, to the human brain, to the peripheral system? How can you realize that? Basic brain machine interfaces was kind of what got me into this. And it, it really is interesting. It covers all spaces all the way from analog circuitry, electrodes, to digital processing, communication, wireless, power delivery, and so on and so forth. So we're still uh, pursuing this. I actually am doing quite a bit of work on um, non-invasive devices these days, trying to basically get signals such as the, as the EMG signals and other information to basically help uh, make better prosthetics and with direct feedback and so on and so forth. Now, the other side of what I've been looking for when I start looking at the brain, I realized indeed that it is an amazingly efficient machine. And it has opened a lot of door for innovative ways of building the next generation computing. And this could go in many different ways. It could be neuro inspired. It could be things like neural nets. It could be uh, things like neuromorphic, which are more following the, the brain structure. But I think there's a lot of ideas to be gathered there. And I think it will impact the way we're gonna see computers being built in the generations going forward. Very good, thank you. And uh, next, Jack. Hi, I'm Jack Gallant. I'm uh, Jan's colleague actually at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm an old visual neurophysiologist and computational neuroscientist, although these days mostly I work in the area of MRI. Uh, but I actually on this panel because I'm the incoming chair of the IEEE brain community. Uh, the IEEE brain community started six years ago now. Uh, it was it's been shepherded for the first five years of its life by Paul Scheida, uh, who I don't think is can be here this afternoon. Uh, 
but he's the outgoing chair and I'm coming in and I'm happy to provide information about that. Okay, very good. Uh, so Mike, you're next. Sorry. All right, thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, yes, I'm a project leader in neuromorphic computing at uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and very excited to be here. We're looking at emerging devices, uh, things that are naturally spiking, um, and then how to, put, how to put those together in sort of bio-inspired architectures um, and, and whether or not those can be useful for computation or whether or not those could be useful for uh, simulation of, of brain type functions um, where you can uh, poke things apart. And then I should also mention, I'm, I'm here representing the Magnetic Society uh, where there's a, a good number of people working on neuromorphic computing with emerging devices, but also with uh, magnetic resonance imaging and sensing. Um, and so there's, there's a strong tie in. And, we're excited to be part of this community and uh, seeing kind of this other side from the neuroscience side. So it's, it's very exciting. Thanks. Very good. Uh, and Ricky, you're up next. Hi, I'm Ricky Muller. I'm also a faculty member at UC Berkeley. Uh, Jack and Jan are both my colleagues as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm representing the Solid State Circuit Society. I'm a um, an integrated circuit designer by training. And I work on miniaturized implantable wireless neural interfaces, typically systems that are enabled by integrated circuits and microsystems technologies and wireless technologies. Um, of course, you, you know, I'm representing solid state circuits, but the neurotechnology cannot be done by designing chips alone. So um, really this is, uh, I'm glad to be joining this discussion about how to strengthen our engagement uh, with IEEE brain and figure out how to work together across societies to, to actually make these devices happen. I should mention that I also have a background in translation of, of clinical devices as well. Very good. Okay, now we're going to go on to Liliana. Uh, hi, my name is Liliana Trajkovic and I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University. Uh, my research is really in analysis of traffic data and the applying of various techniques to detect anomalies in internet. But I got involved and I think I'm invited here today because uh, I'm a SMC Society representative to the brain uh, now technical community and I've been involved with the uh, technical community for uh, quite a long time from the very beginning in December, I believe of 2019, it was the first meeting. and. Um, I'm also part of the organization for the hackathons. I'm currently editor-in-chief for the Transactions on Human and Machine Systems, where we publish a lot of papers on BCI and BMI, EEG. And so that's why I'm here on this panel. So thank you very much for inviting me. Very good. Okay, Damien. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me there? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, Damien Coyle here. I'm professor of neurotechnology at Ulster University, which is in Northern Ireland, uh, United Kingdom. I am also CEO of a small startup, uh, Neuroconcise Limited. So my area of research is in EEG-based brain-computer interfaces mainly, and we do a lot of trials with patients who have disorders of consciousness and are, are in, a, in a, an unknown state of consciousness due to brain injury. We also apply it in, in stroke rehabilitation, um, and we've done some trials with neurofeedback in, in post-traumatic stress disorder in Rwanda. So I'm here representing the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society, uh, and I see a few award winners from the, the Computational Intelligence Society on the panel here. I think that the Computational Intelligence Society has a lot to offer to, to IEEE Brain in terms of you know, a lot of our researchers and members are focused on taking inspiration from the brain to develop new artificial intelligence and computational intelligence. And my ambition over the last year has really been to try to get as many of those researchers that are that are that are leading in, in AI research to to try to you know help with some of the problems such as non-stationary dynamics and, and biological signals and uh, subject to subject variability and so on. So I think. IEEE Computational Intelligence Society is well placed within IEEE brain. Okay, very good. Uh, now there are four others on this uh, the list. Uh, 
that I don't see uh, here in person, Paul Berger, Carolyn McGregor, Paul Seda, and Michael Smith. And if you happen to be, and I don't see you, you should. Uh... I'm here, Paul Berger. Oh, Paul Berger, you know, I didn't see your face, so I figured that you weren't here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm representing the Electron Device Society, and um, so I'm just kind of sitting in, trying to see where the Electron Device Society can add to the uh, hardware, um, because I think some of the uh, some of the hardware, uh, you, you know, it is not as advanced as as our uh, advanced microchips and microprocessors and so forth. So there's a lot of things I think the Electron Device Society could uh, offer as this uh, technology matures. Okay, that, that's that's wonderful. I think now we we have such a, a, a distinguished panel here, um, and I want to throw out a, a question. Uh, and and it, it, it's really at this interface between the real world you know, in all its complexity and uh, computers, right? BCI. Uh, so one of the things that we've been able to do is to tap into using electrodes, uh, for example, with uh, BCI, but also with uh, fMRI. And we, we've, we've created these interfaces. And the question is, where is that heading? Uh, are, are, are we going to be uh, using different types of signals for different purposes? Uh, does anybody have any insights into where the technology is going? Uh, I know Jack, for example, has had a, a lot of work, uh, done a lot of work on decoding, you know, mind reading. <laughs> so Jack, could you start by just giving your insights as a neuroscientist? Uh, well, I'll, I'll give my insights as a neuroscientist and as um, the future head of the IEEE brain community. Um, you know, as I said at the very first introduction of this conference yesterday, um, our understanding of the brain and our ability to manipulate the brain is really measurement limited. We, we can't measure the stuff that's in there. Um, we can't manipulate the stuff that's in there very well, certainly not in humans. In rodents, we can do quite a lot, but we can't do much in humans. And this is mostly an engineering problem. We can't build biologically compatible materials that we can put in people for a long period of time. We don't have electrodes that are small enough to uh, be biocompatible and not cause damage to the brain. Um, basically, there's a whole host of engineering problems that need to be solved, uh, both on the biomaterials and the electronic fabrication and the uh, biocompatibility and the signal processing and the energy use fronts. All of these uh, present really really, really strong problems to uh, measurement and manipulation in the in the brain. So this is going to, this is not, a, the brain is not a problem that can be solved by neuroscientists. They're, they're the scientists, they're the ones that will, you know, do the brain investigation, but they need the tools to do their job. And the tools are going to come predominantly from uh, neuroengineers. So this is a, um, a really important problem for the IEEE. Now the, the question Terry asked specifically was, well, what's the future? And the future is nobody knows because there is no technology we have currently that we can envision scaling up and solving this measurement and manipulation problem. There are a, a lot of unknowns. And of course, in an area of technology development that involves a lot of unknowns, that means that there's gonna be a lot of dead ends and 95% of the things that people try are not gonna work. And we need to try those 95% of the things in order to find the 5% that will work. So I think that the, um, the neurotechnology development field is going to kind of uh, evolve in a punctuated equilibrium kind of way where there will be long periods of apparent stasis while work is being done behind the scenes, followed by a few breakthroughs using neurotechnologies that uh, perhaps haven't even been developed yet. Okay, so Jack, I, you, you, let me summarize it. You see the glass... 95% empty and 5% full, right? <laughs> I think that's the current state of the field, okay. yeah. But okay. that's not my feeling about the future. So, uh, uh, you know, I think I'm more hopeful and, and I I'm encouraged by the fact that the Brain Initiative, which uh, was launched in 2013, so it's not yet 10 years old. Uh, during that time, the, the number of neurons you can record simultaneously went from about 100 with the Utah array, that was the technology still being used, to now the record is a million neurons at the same time. 
optically. Right. I, I was only being pessimistic about humans. If you're recording from rodents, the world is your oyster. Well, uh, you know, if, if you can get it to work in the mouse, then it's just a matter of time. You know, it's, these are solvable problems. You're right, but the interface materials problem is really severe. But I don't think it's. I agree. It's just time and money. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that's right. And and, uh, and and the fact that we made we went from a hundred to a million. Uh, that, you know, that's a that's a factor of. Uh, 10 to the fourth, right, in less than 10 years, suggests that there's a lot of room there to expand. Okay, anyone else want to jump in? Okay, I think you set the stage. Yeah, I, would like to, I would like to make a comment, actually. I agree with Jack that he's, uh, but I'm a little bit optimistic. If you look at the last 10 years, maybe 20 years, we have made a lot of progress. I think right now, lots of technologies developed and we are able to monitor and control at least uh, some brain activities uh, but mainly focusing on treat the neurological disease, including Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and also depression. I think the challenge is going to be, one is to look at the problem from all the way to molecular to systemic and behavior level and the multi-scale problem. Because if you look at most of the drugs or maybe half of the drugs are developed based on looking for gene regulatory networks. But also the cellular level, I think it's uh, even uh, yourself, uh, uh, you published the early papers that is the networking of the neurons, not individual neurons, their joint behavior matters. So we need to look at the wide spectrum to understand the mechanism, to better monitor, better control, and also to develop the better treatment. And I'm sure that is, uh, Joseph Principe will make a comment about interface. Interface still is a bottleneck and uh, we need to look at it. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I am not sure if, if um, what I wanted to say is related to, to the multi-scale analysis of the brain. You know, I, I really think that it's 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 very very nice that people are looking at the you know at the optical um, uh, you know imaging and things like that because it's it's the real idea you know if you have a, a system as complex as the brain if you want to 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 to, re, to collect data from the brain then you use you have to use some form of a field um, process okay so the interface is have to be, well, I think we have to really re-engineer these ideas of, of interfaces because what we would like to do is to collect signals as a wave, right? And there may be very interesting ways, you know, that we can extract information from quantum systems and things like that, that may effectively give us a way of going from the, the locality, the specificity, and also to the you know, to a, a point in, in space, but also that we can collect information at a lower resolution, per, perhaps, at the, at the over sp space. So I really think that uh, I'm very hopeful, you know, signal processing is exactly this. We think about um, the reality and we come up with models, you know, and I, I really, uh, so I'm also very hopeful, but I think that uh, we are not yet at, in the right track to reach the goal. That's what I think. We still need, we are doing a random search and we may need to continue doing a random search for some years, you know, until we find the, the best approach. So let me summarize. You're saying that basically we're just doing a random walk in a high dimensional space and moving forward very slowly. I, I, I would agree with that, Terry, you know, oh, I, think I, I, I actually I was I thought it was exaggerating, what you were saying, but, but no, there is a, there's truth to that. That's, uh, I think, how all of science and engineering takes place, you know, exactly. two, two steps forward, one step backwards. But, you know, it, it, the drift, there's a drift term here, too, right, where there's, yes. there's a little force it, 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 pushing us in the right direction. You know, you make little victories along the way. But uh, but I, I'm actually amazed at uh how I mentioned that uh, we've leapt forward in the number of neurons that can be recorded. But this another really promising, uh, uh, I think, uh, advances are occurring in analyzing data. 
So again, you know, when, when we hit, we're recording one neuron at a time, you know, it was, the, you know, the, 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 the techniques that were being used were very simple, post-stimulus time histogram. But now if you can record from, and routinely, people record from tens of thousands of neurons with uh, neuropixels, by the way, these are uh, silicon shafts with a thousand mm -hmm. uh, locations where you can record from a neuron, a little, a little uh, conductive location. And you can put dozens of these into brains, right? And, and by the way, they came out of IMEC. Uh, someone I know is, is I hear from uh, Jan is, is from that, uh, you, know, you know, the fab that, that creates these chips. Uh, and then that has revolutionized actually the way we think about the brains. Why? It's not just the number of neurons, but now we can record from dozens of brain areas at the same time. And we're getting a global picture. And I think that that, that is really where new discoveries are going to occur. Uh, whenever you have a new tool technique or expand the, the resolution, um, that's when new discoveries occur. So I wonder if anybody can speak to this issue of data analysis, because big data has really become a big deal, in, as you know, in throughout the, 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 the world in terms of uh, the internet, uh, but it's also true in science, right? We're, we're getting deluged with data. So uh, machine learning is, has come around. Uh, those tools and techniques are getting better. But uh, what, what is, uh, does anybody have any insights into what new data analysis tools are needed to make progress uh, with recordings from, uh, to, we, that we currently have from uh, different uh, modalities? Well, let, let, me, let me just give a, 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 short, a short view of this, um, Terry. Um, um, of course, I am. I think that there is a modality that we should revisit. Uh, that is the local field potentials. You know, the local field potentials is really uh, an intermediate, a mesoscopic level of analysis. You know, the signals that are collected in the brain, that I think will be excellent to you know to link the neural activity to behavior. So I really think that specifically in this multi-scale analysis of the brain, I think that the role of local fields, I think that is going to be more and more important. And this requires new tools, new signal processing methodologies to effectively extract the relevant information from the local fields. You know, so I'm not addressing the problem of big data as Terry question is, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm addressing the issue of methodologies that are able to extract, you know, transient phenomena in the, in the local fields. That I think is something that uh, um, it's going to be, in my view, very important for the future. Well, of course, that's a signal that's been around for a long time. Yes, this is the first the, one. <laughs> more or less ignored by neurophysiologists once the single unit technique uh, was, was discovered by, uh, you know, early, late 50s. And it became possible to record from single neurons. And that, that really took over. The uh, EEG kind of went out the window, uh, local field potentials. But I think they're going to make a comeback. I agree with you there. I think that uh, there's a lot of information there. It's, it's, uh, it is inter intermediate between EEG and single neurons. But it's... it's and the other thing that why it's important is that it reflects not the output from the area, but the input, because there's primarily synaptic potentials and ion mm -hmm. channels that are presynaptic, that are you know in the in the dendrites. And the, and As a neurophysiologist, I'm just gonna make the claim that probably 75% of the stuff we know from single cells you could get out of local field potentials. So um, people just record single cells in neurophysiology because they're competitive with the other neurophysiologists and they want to have better data. That's, that's really what's going on. It's more of a social thing. Um, so Jack, what, what, you're, you're in the minority. Okay, so Yeah, I know. Well, one of the uh, things I wanted to add about the, this issue about um, modern data science and machine learning, I, I think the development of data science in computer science and uh, sort of at uh, adoption of data science methods into classical statistics and experimental science is a huge boon for neuroscience and for um, all neuroscience adjacent fields, uh, such as neurotechnology development, because it's forcing uh, the field as a whole to improve its methods and to reduce the type one error rate and the false positive rate and to increase generalization and to focus on prediction accuracy rather than statistical significance, which is gonna benefit everybody in the long run. But um, the 
disadvantage of the data science approaches, and I, I guess it, it's kind of weird to say it's a disadvantage, it's just a limitation, is that most of the work in uh, data science and the, most of the work in, say, the field of artificial neural networks kind of assumes implicitly that you have infinite data or close to infinite data. And the problem we have in neuroscience is, again, we're measurement limited and we usually don't have infinite data. Even if you can record from a million neurons in a mouse, you probably won't record from them for that long. And since the brain is a non-stationary dynamical system that learns constantly on all time scales, you know, you need kind of large data sets to accommodate the different modes of activity of the brain and to uh, deal with the non-stationarities. And so that's the collecting very large, long time scale data sets is gonna be a challenge for the future for neurotechnologists and neuroscientists and figuring out what to do with those nonlinear dynamical data is gonna be a, a real challenge for uh, the modelers. So th but that's a good a really, one. That's a really uh, important insight that uh, the, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, just a segue into the next uh, issue, which is behavior. Um, so there was a, a paradox that occurred about, oh, maybe five, 10 years ago when it became possible, people were recording, you know, from uh, with Utah arrays up, you know, to, uh, on the order of a few hundred uh, single units, and and actually, it turns out you can use hash too. I mean, you don't need single units; you can get good predictive data out of hash, which is you know, averaging spikes from a bunch of neurons. Um, but what they discovered is that uh, it, it beyond about you know fifty to hundred uh, did not give them any more predictive power. Uh, 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 you know, in terms of the number of neurons that went into making the prediction, right, with, with regression, and whatever techniques they use, and 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 you know, the the, the paradox is finally resolved when they when they be realize that, you know, the task that they're recording, they're, they typically have a monkey that is 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 fixed to a chair, and is a screen, and it's it has to react to a visual stimulus, and there's a limited number of them, and then it has to press a button. Did I see this before? You know that 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 is a very low dimensional task. Right? <laughs> it, it turns out that you know you don't need the whole brain to solve it. It just you know you can you can solve it with a few neurons, mm -hmm. and so really the challenge I think is to try to study more complex behaviors. Because just mm -hmm. recording from our neurons, if 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 doesn't give you more leverage, uh, it, and and now the question is, which behaviors under what conditions? Is it you, you can't you know? Is there something between freely moving and uh, strapped down? And uh, of course we have humans. <laughs> so, uh, what? Okay, so here's a, now a revelation, which is that um, I've uh, I've worked a lot on sleep. I, I, I collaborated with neurophysiologists who record from cortical neurons during sleep, I've published many papers, uh, and specifically on sleep spindles. Sleep spindles occur uh, during an intermediate uh, state between dream sleep, REM sleep, and slow wave. And it turns out these sleep spindles are very important for memory consolidation. Uh, they last about two seconds. They occur thousands of times during the night. Typically, you know, it's uh, 10 to 14 hertz uh, at about, it, it lasts about two seconds and it, 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 it's, it's global. It's not just a particular location, it's global. And it was, it was thought that this was uh, synchronous across the whole cortex, but in fact, uh, starting out about uh, five years ago, I collaborated with Sid Cash at Mass General Hospital in Boston on analyzing data from Epilepsy patients. So they implant a grid. It's typically, uh, you know, a, a hundred uh, lo uh, locations, but it's very crude in the sense that it's on the surface and it's a centimeter or so. So you're really it's it's, it's a little better than the EEG, but uh, not as good as the LFP. But you, it's very very revealing. And in fact, we had uh, hundreds and hours of, of of data from patients. Okay, they get implanted and they have to sit there for a couple of weeks in order to. For them to get the uh, the seizures so that they know where the focus is, so they could take it out. Right, that's why they're there. But uh, the, we we analyzed the sleep data and for, got the spindles and so forth. And what we discovered is that it's not a synchronous event; it's a traveling wave. Right, it's, it's, it goes around the cortex and it, it circulates. It's a circular traveling wave. Now, you know that that 
was not discovered in the mouse. It was not discovered in other species. It was discovered in the human. And I, I think this is a, an untapped potential here. And I know that some people uh, have, have, have uh, you know, research scientists have connected up at UCSF and elsewhere. But you know, the, we're talking about humans. We're talking about humans. You can study language, which can't be studied in any other species. And I, I wonder what, what people are thinking about where the future of that is going to head, uh, is going to lead to. I, I think it's really a, a fantastic uh, resource and opportunity just to have to, to sit there and, and take advantage of the data. And it's you know, it's unfortunate these patients have are doing it uh, under great uh, stress. But you know, it, it's so important, I think, to be able to, 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 to actually use the data that is coming from those recordings. Does any, anybody could jump in here. Let's hear from someone else. I, I wanted to say something about the data because I work with large data, but from different system. And uh, in my experience, not all data are good enough for analysis. So for example, from yeah. some collection we had, only 20% of the data was actually reliable. So it was always important to have a resident expert to sort of guide us, which uh, of the data that we use are actually useful for analysis. And along these lines of data, it would be very useful for research community to actually have a repository of the data samples yeah. so that we can apply various methods. And there are a variety of methods in machine learning these days I mean, that, that are popping up. Uh, some uh, have advantages in terms of uh, doing better in um, recall and in sensitivity, in F score. Uh, some are better because uh, the training is very short, especially if you want to do something in real time. So it would be nice if we can have a, a, a sort of benchmarks that uh, would be made available to the research community to do analysis uh, uh, of the data. So Liliana, thank you so much for bringing this up because uh, up until recently, it was very difficult. You know, neuroscientists would collect data, but they would hold on to them. And, and, and that's all changing. Uh, the Brain Initiative, I wrote the section on data sharing. And, and my colleagues were just appalled because they said, hey, look, I, I collected this, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. And my student needs to write papers from it. Why, why should I give it away to anybody, right? And, and of course, what happens is that when the student leaves, the, the PI doesn't even know where to find it, right? let alone the format and so forth. And so and that's all changed now because the Brain Initiative has yeah. required that everybody who does an experiment mm -hmm. with Brain Initiative money has to put into a repository. And that now is actually, be, be, your point is that it's becoming, uh, two things have happened. First of all, people have had to clean up their data, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And put it into a common format. And second of all, it really is making it possible for as new tools and techniques and, and analysis uh, is, 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 is developed and, and, and it's, you know, larger scale uh, computational models uh, that we can go back and revisit. The data are yeah. perfectly good and, and it's just reinterpreting what's there. Yeah, yeah. and actually there is it. IEEE data port. It's a repository. Yeah, you can upload perfect. everything to IEEE yeah. data port, make it, make it available. I did a mm -hmm. check recently if there is anything from the brain community, but there is a large repository yeah. uh, and it's open to public. Maybe maybe there is some fee in order to download some data. Go ahead, Matthew. Sorry, I interrupted. And there are brain imaging repositories too, which are uh, again uh, now the trouble. There's there's different. There's, there's, it's not easy. It turns out it's very it's it's non-trivial. And the reason is that it turns out that every uh, say brain imaging center has a different format way of collecting the data or format that they use or the analysis that the pre-processing that they've done. And so you're not getting raw data, you're getting some version of it that is been corrupted actually, as it turns out by the, the techniques that people were using to smooth it or whatever. So yeah, but but that's a work in progress. I, I think there's a lot more, uh, I mean, we have a we have a really promising start now to a new era where data, big data, are going to be shared. Okay, uh, does anybody want to? Uh, uh, I'd like to get somebody to talk about behavior, right? Come on, this is really at the core of what we're trying to do: is to uh, either understand how the behavior is generated by the brain, or trying to help people whose brain are damaged produce better behavior, right? And so, what what do we? Wh where are we going with behavior? And I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if nobody else is. Could I, could I jump in there, Terrence? Yes, please. Yes. I noticed you mentioned that EEG went, went out the window. And, um, you know, I just want to make the point that 
EEG is probably having the biggest impact currently on, on patients and patients' lives. You know, it's been deployed. You know, when I started out in EEG, probably 15, 20 years ago, you know, we had a big device, big amplifier in the lab. Now I've got one in my hand here, you know, it's, it flows around the head. You know, so it, it can be collected quite easily, um, easier than any other modalities we're talking about here today. And and there are quite large data sets being, being developed from the EEG front. And there's a lot of evidence that transfer learning and various other things can, can enhance accuracy in, in EEG technology. So I don't think we should ignore EEG in this in this discussion for sure. Oh, no, no, I, I, by, by no means I want to, uh, to imply that. I was just yeah. making a historical comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's fashionable, right? Things that become fashionable and they go out of fashion. Uh, but you're absolutely right uh, that, that uh, there's a st storehouse of information that we can now extract. In fact, uh, I developed an algorithm in the 1990s, independent component analysis, which is now universally used to get rid of artifacts in uh, yeah. EEG. It's absolutely essential because there's so many artifacts, but it turns out ICA was just the, exactly the right thing that you need. It, it, it's a linear mixture. It can subtract the artifact out as an as a, as a, a independent component. And it's also being used to analyze uh, fMRI data, uh, you know, it, it's, it's it yeah. just, you know, you, they, people use it now. It's unsupervised uh, learning, uh, machine learning. Every day, so it, uh, yeah, it's, that's amazing. Now that yeah. It's really helpful. Yeah. Right. So uh, there, are, there are other methods too. I, I agree that e, uh, in a wearable portable EEG is, you know, a potential gold mine. There's also portable FNR systems that people are developing and deploying in the wild. Uh, and the other thing that I think is the, in, the invasive technology that is going to be deployed in the wild to measure behavior the soonest is probably the new deep brain stimulators uh, that come along with recording electrodes. So those are patients that they have deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's or depression or another need. And they're, uh, you know, th these uh, devices are set up in the lab and deployed. And in the latest iteration of these devices, they actually have recording electrodes in order to uh, hopefully have more actionable information to optimize uh, the deep brain stimulator. So those devices are being worn 24 seven by people and um, they could potentially provide information about behavior in the brain that we wouldn't be able to get really any other way. So I, I think the, the field is really moving, the consumer neurotechnology field is moving fast to deploy EEG and FNRs um, in, uh, in large numbers of people. The IEEE brain community actually just had a meeting about this exact topic uh, a week ago. Um, so, so, you know, more behavior as, as we collect more long-term data sets from the wild, I think the importance of behavior will become increasingly apparent to people. You know, the, the, you're, you're, you're actually pointing out something that was really critical because almost all the event related potential literature is based on, again, putting a human being, you know, locking them down their head and, and so forth so that they, they're focused. Um, so we've had a mobile EEG lab here for about 10 years of allowing someone to walk around the room with virtual reality, in fact. and. Uh, it really changes the, the picture because you really get a feeling that, and, and again, the, the, the just walking is a, a very complex behavior. And it, and you see the brain just changes completely. And, and we've known this actually for a, a, a while from the recording from mice and, and, and in flies, in fact, that when they start moving, the, 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 the activity in the visual system suddenly ramps up by factor of two. Right, and and so that that tells you that uh, you know, there's an intimate relationship between movement and sensory input. So, uh, Gert, how are we doing for time? Uh, we're doing we're doing great. Uh, so, um, you want to make sure that um, so all the different uh, viewpoints uh, of so the, including different societies that are sponsoring IPP Brain that they're all representing discussions here. We heard a lot about um, uh, data algorithms. Um, and um, uh, yes, so, so perhaps we can have some perspectives also on, on the other sides of things. Uh, we haven't heard about electron devices or magnetics or, well, to some extent we have, but uh, yeah, so, so please we can have panelists speak up and, and give the perspective. Yeah, you know, at, at this point, uh, you know, I've, had, I've, I've run out of my questions, so I'd like someone else to come up with a good question. <laughs> Who hasn't spoken yet? Do you have anyone? Yeah. Um, Asking questions in the, among attendees. Oh, we should check in, in the chat. You know, it's not a 
question as a comment. Most of these machine learning algorithms, they are good for prediction and it's good analytical tools and helpful. But how much do we learn using these tools about the, indeed the biological complexity of the brain? Okay, so, uh, so he, you know, this is now, I'm getting into my own research, but uh, and, 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 and others, uh, and this is work that's been done with the optical recording, uh, Dave Tank's lab at Princeton and many other places. And what, what, what uh, Matteo Carandini, uh, Ann Churchland, what they discovered is that their uh, individual system, spontaneous activity that was originally noticed by Hugo and Weasel, that that's, it's not random noise. It turns out that it contains a lot of information about the movement of the body. In other words, uh, the, in the mouse, the snout and the whiskers are always moving, right, and breathing. And it turns out that from the spontaneous activity, you can predict the movements of, of those uh, parts of the, of the mouse. And <laughs> conversely, from the movement, you can predict the spontaneous activity. So look, that's telling you that the idea of modularity in the brain has to be revised, right? It's not just a purely visual cortex, B1. It, it contains information about movements. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that you can do with machine learning, and, and it has now been really uh, advanced, uh, like I say, by Dave Tank and others, is you can uh, follow a continuous behavior, and then you can, uh, Mark Churchland did this at uh, Columbia, and you can now look at the flow of the activity in the population of neurons as the animal goes through the different sequences of steps in order to accomplish something, reach its hand out, press a button or a lever and pull the lever. And what, what they discover is that uh, if, you have, if you do it over and over again, what you do, you get a, uh, a tube, they call it a hyper tube in this very high dimensional space where you record from uh, you know, 20,000 neurons and, and, and it, it's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, people notice that, you know, you get different spiking patterns every time you do it, but it turns out it's constrained to a very low dimensional subscript. And I think without the tools that uh, analysis tools, we wouldn't have found that, right? And this is a, a very important because if you just look at Hubel and Weasel, what they, would, what they concluded, they, they re repeated the same stimulus over and over again. They say, well, the spiking pattern is different. Therefore we have to average over trials. And you know that's silly because you know perception doesn't require 100 trials to <laughs> see something. And now we know that in fact the, the spontaneous activity, depending when the visual system visual stimulus comes in, it's going to be uh, integrated with whatever is spontaneous pattern representing motor system, and that's going to be different from moment to moment. So that you know, the, the, I you know I think that we're on the verge here of a, of a completely new conceptual framework that we have to. We have to think very differently about, uh, and, and it's, it really comes out of a much more sophisticated data analysis than people were using back in the days when they were just looking at one neuron at a time. Yes, so Terry. So we have um, uh, Nitish had his raised, and also in, in the chat, uh, people want to hear from Ricky and uh, Ricky Muller and Jan Rabai. Uh, okay, Nidish, I, about let's, deep implanted devices. Let's start with Nitish, and then we can go yeah. on. Yeah, and actually, it'd be good, Gerd, if you could point this out to me because I tend to. Uh, Go on, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, we can talk science till the forever. So I'll want to probe you for policy and perhaps in the end money. Like what is after brain initiative, right? There was, we'll cure cancer. So we have had that kind of thing and then it has a life. And uh, how do we keep the brain initiative going? You know, European Union had its own big bulge and then bit of a backlash. So. Do you have a sense of the way the politics of science politics and future is shaping up? Well, I, I, I can extrapolate. So we, we, we know we had an- and, and Terry, this is a question for the panel, right? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. No, but Terry was on the original one, so at least he- no, okay, I, sure I was is. on the committee that we, we, we produced a document, the uh, advisory document to the director of NIH and I'll, I'll just say a brief thing, and then we can go in others. I think we'll have a different perspective. But um, when, when we started our, our, our committee, the uh, Francis Collins, the you know, NIH director, gave us a charge. And here's what he said. He said that, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues think it's a waste of money to sequence the whole genome, right? Just the coding sequences are important. And 
there isn't a single person now who thinks it was a waste of money. And what happened was it was like $3 billion for the first human genome. But what happened after that was that it, the two, two things happened. First, it completely transformed biology because instead of thinking about one gene at a time, you can think about all the genes. And number two, the technology for sequencing got better and better and better and better. In other words, once you launch a, a technology push, which is what created the, the human genome, then it has a life of its own. There's a whole industry. There's a whole, uh, you know, and I think the same thing is going to happen with neurotechnology. I mean, in, in other words, I already see it happening. There's a lot of startups. There's a lot of companies, uh, neural links where, you know, Elon Musk's company, they, they, they actually have a sewing machine, which puts electrodes in. <laughs> uh, and so you can record many, many, many parts of the brain very quickly. But, um, but in terms of, you know, where, What's going to happen with neurotechnology? I think that uh, I think it'll go down the same path that sequencing went down. That is to say, uh, as you know, the brain initiative was was it was specifically about innovative neurotechnology, and all the money for the first five years went to teams of engineers and neuroscientists, and and that's where all the you know tremendous amount of of, of you know, maybe 95% of it, it didn't lead anywhere, but that's okay because the 5% that made it was really important. Uh, you know, there's a portable pet, you know, someone from West Virginia University <laughs> has a pet device that, you know, you can put on and you can walk around. I mean, it was very innovative. And, and I think that that's, that, that is going to continue. I mean, uh, you probably know that NIH is very conservative and, and it really, there wasn't a lot of resources up until recently for developing new tools and techniques, but now that's all changed. I'm glad you're optimistic. And just one caveat that of course there is an A genome and that's 3 billion. And so we have 80 billion and 10 to power 15 synapses and Jack will fight for MR and others will fight for electrode arrays and then electrical and optical and it's a, you know, and then there is behavior. So I, I don't know whether the scale is right, but I do agree that there is certain translational impact that's so obvious both for science and clinical. Uh, as so, I, yeah, no, let me give you an example of, uh, you know, Jack brought up deep brain stimulation. So one of the people, we, we asked 48, uh, you know, distinguished neuroscientists to tell us about what, what tools and techniques would help them in their research. And, um, and so it, it, it turns out that uh, <laughs> we discovered that DBI was using a technology at the time, this is back in uh, 2013, that DBI was using a, 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 a probe that had three contacts. It was the size of a knitting needle. And it had been approved by the FDA 30 years before, right? And, and you know, this, this is like, you know, you know the, the, all we have to do is take the existing technology of the monkey and get it approved and you'd be 30 years ahead, right? <laughs> In terms of what you can do with humans. And, uh, and so now DBI, it's not just that you can record from more places or, uh, and stimulate with a, a more precision, but there's a feedback now. Right, there's, there's a way to, in, in the case of epilepsy, you can detect uh, the activity that may be predicting uh, that there's a, a imminent seizure. And then you can go and stimulate and you can try, try to prevent that from happening. And the same thing's gonna happen with DBI because you can use as the uh, feedback, you know, the, the, the patient's uh, symptoms and use that as a uh, way to uh, get the feedback uh, to be able to automatically, I think they want to do it automatically, actually, I don't know how they're going to do that, but in order to automatically optimize from moment to moment, day to day, and so forth. Okay, so let me just randomly ask, uh, let's say, I should say, sorry, so there's a question in a chat asking to hear okay. uh, Ricky's and uh, Jan's perspectives, so maybe well, uh, that's fine. I was just about it. to ask, I was just about to ask Ricky, okay, so, <laughs> okay, good, thanks. The floor. Uh, yeah, so actually I'm going to take this all the way back to the very first question, which was where are we heading? And the major part of the discussion that we've been having on this panel has really been about getting large data sets, recording, accessing a lot of information from the brain, decoding that, understanding it with big data. And I think, uh, you, you know, this is currently 
uh, very much in focus because we're in an era of discovery. We just don't know enough to, uh, for example, treat disease. But I really think that what comes next is a focus on treating disease by closing the loop and giving devices intelligence and the ability to monitor, diagnose, and treat disease autonomously. And for this, the focus won't be on electrode counts. It's going to be on the intelligence in the device that works in symbiosis with the brain. And closing the loop was actually a major focus of the IEEE Brain Bite paper. And we can probably have a whole separate panel discussion just on this topic. And, 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 and by the way, uh, developing uh, analytic tools that, that can be used in real time is also a challenge, right? Because, you mm -hmm. know, right now we're doing it all offline. We have these massive computers sitting there, right? Well, you can't, if, you know, if the, if the person is mobile, you're not going to be able to ethernet. Them. Absolutely. In real time, on device, adaptable, as was mentioned before, these are all major challenges. Yep. Yeah, yep. I think yeah, really need to be addressed. Them. But I think that they have already been working that, you know, I can recall, for instance, one of my students, you know, we came up with this idea of brain machine interfaces that uh, talk with the brain through a reinforcement learning algorithm. So this is really the essence of this, you know, communication and was in real time. Imagine it was in real time that we could do that communication. So. But the, as I, but the issue, I think, Ricky, is how do you expand this from these laboratory experiments to effectively clinical things? That is where I think is the, 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 big, the big step, because these demonstrations, they have been around. It, it, well, you had, it was done in the lab with a, a big computer sitting there, right? You know. Of course, of course, but it was in real time. That was already yeah, something. No, no. It, it's it's uh, hard enough computing at it, and you're, you're going to be able to get any algorithm to work, but the, the, the making it practical is another level of complexity that has to be solved. But it, it's it's actually beyond that, because if you have a mobile person, you have all these artifacts, right? Motion artifacts. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I'm amazed at... Uh, People have found ways of getting around that, uh, even, even with DBI and so forth. Because I mean, those are people walking like around, right? Mm -hmm. I I would like to uh, follow up Ricky's comment. I fully agree with her. Actually, the not only data part, but also the smart senses with the intelligent, uh, the machine learning. But the closing the loop is not just the visual closing the loop for brain computer interface. She and I, I think I also agree with her on this. She's talking about the automated system in a way that is when there is a certain activities going on and the extract information and activate the neurostimulator or stimulator or optogen, whatever you're using to close the loop in a sense for, this is very, very important for drug release, for mental issues and the many other things, I think. Okay, so the, uh, the, I'd like to ask, you know, this is going to require miniaturizing things, right? You know, getting, shrinking things down to the point where you can implant them. And I, I'd like the hardware people to chime in now about energy, compact system and energy efficient system. E energy efficiency. There you go. If, you know, where are we there? And, and how, where, where, how can we improve uh, the existing technology that we have? Yeah, this is the major thrust in within the solid state circuit society, essentially putting, um, you know, different types of, of uh, classifiers, signal processing on chip, on device, in such low power that it is actually within the implant able to perform these computations or decisions with low latency. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have mm -hmm. to send it through a wireless link. It's the device itself that is. Um, that's able to make the decisions. There are a lot of challenges in terms of how you train such a device, what you actually put on chip. You know, uh, a, a lot of the algorithms are very static, very difficult to update and retrain. And so people have been looking at you know, one thrust in my group, for example, doing unsupervised online learning that is very low power on chip so that, so that you can have uh, a learning algorithm that is constantly adapting to the dynamics in the brain. 
that's, by the way, a secret of the brain. The brain is always adapting, right? That's one of the fundamental principles. And, uh, you know, and if you look at the brain compared to transistors, they're much more variable in terms of heterogeneous you know, offsets and so forth. But, uh, but the brain gets around that because every single component is plastic and can be adjusted according to you know, getting it into a range, operating range where it's working efficiently. Right, and it's very difficult to do this experimentally because we don't, you know, we, we initially do this research with data sets that are kind of pre-existing and they're not really interacting with the algorithms. So they can't, we can't observe this, uh, this dynamic of how the brain will respond to the device itself until we actually deploy the device. So there's, there's a major chicken and egg problem with very long development cycles. Well, uh, got to start somewhere, <laughs> but it's good. I'm glad that you're, uh, you know, been able to take up the, the challenge. And uh, did anyone else have any insights into problems that we're going to run into, you know, that you've seen or maybe you've heard about? I mean, I'll, I'll just say had something on the box actually. Yes, there's a hand raised. Oh, is there, you're Juris. Is that the hand I see? Yeah, hi. Uh, may I? Yeah, go right. ahead. And the mic will be next. So, uh, my name is Juris, and uh, I'm, um, I've been developing my own kind of BCI solution for a VR for the past uh, six years including the hardware and software, and I'm interested mostly in uh, real-time processing. And uh, I've looked in the, into all kinds of research papers, all sorts of methodologies uh, for, uh, for, for, for machine-learned sort of classifiers. And um, lately, uh, recently, I came upon some cognitive neuroscience research and some of these uh, some of these talks here led me on to some ideas about whether is whether there's research which uh, so um, uh, whether there's research uh, that can record and correlate somehow and uh, deduce some meaning from the connections within the brain, not from you know not from the millions of neurons as they trigger or not trigger in a certain region, but how this um, signal flows through the brain to other, uh, to other regions, how this connection is made and how often and how much this happens. Because let's say we have the optical cortex, right, uh, to which um, are uh, to which our eyes send signals through the thalamus, but then the optical cortex sends back information which is almost tenfold to that which it receives. And then thalamus distributes that somewhere else and uh, connects it to other regions of the brain. Uh, but we know very little about these other regions of the brain and their functionality. We mostly know only about these, only about the regions that uh, process kind of audio signals, visual signals, motor signals, and, and the like. But well, we you're, have... you're, 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 you're raising a big mystery. Yeah. Uh, so you just mentioned that uh, the number of uh, fibers going uh, from the cortex back down to the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, right? The th thalamic uh, input from the retina. Uh, there's 10 times more feedback connections than there are feed forward connections, right? And we don't know why, but, mm -hmm. but they, they've got to be important. It wouldn't yeah, be so we're wondering whether there's... there's... And by the way, this is true of every, every cortical area, right? If you go to V2, there are more fibers coming back to V1 than going forward. And so yeah. this internal feedback systems are really ascent. They must be really important for uh, getting the cortex to coordinate and coordinate. We, we, know, we know a little bit, we know that attention from a high level down to the lower level is probably using that pathway. 
but I, I think that it's got to be even more important than that. It's got to be, uh, uh, in, it's, I think that it has to do with time delays. There are like a hundred millisecond time delay between uh, an input, visual input and the, how the infratemporal cortex at the top recognizes objects. So that's, that's really an incredibly long period of time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's got to be some way to speed up uh, the reactions to that object, which are, you know, you can't wait until you see it. You have to be able to make the decision very quickly if it's a dangerous object. But uh, Mike, okay, let, 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 I think it's your turn now. You've been waiting. For sure. Me. Yeah, I was, I was just going to pick up on a thread that Ricky had started, which was uh, coming toward the energy efficiency just from the device side. It's, it's very interesting to hear that, that kind of application. It's certainly something that there's a lot of active research going on in, in more energy efficiency of devices, both in traditional devices and also then things that are novel devices looking at kind of using thermal energy to do computing um, with probabilistic type computing. And those mesh pretty well with machine learning type problems. And this is way out. It's not you know going to be <laughs> in anybody's cell phone anytime soon, but it's the sort of edge applications where power is a major concern that's driving a lot of interesting research on the device side. And so it's, it's great to hear those things and kind of the more we know uh, the specifics then the more varied the solutions can be, right? Um, where you can bring in totally new devices um, that really run near thermal limits um, and, and so I, I think that's a very exciting area. And a very important one, of course, uh, analog uh, circuits have very low power too. And, and maybe Gert can say a few words about that. Yes, and, and uh, Ricky just uh, mentioned some too, right? So <clears throat> extremely low power, of course, what matters is energy per operation or energy per sample, right? Um, everything's normalized, uh, but uh, uh, the community, the circus community, and the sensors community is really reaching or approaching fundamental limits of noise and energy efficiency, which is really uh, great. First of all, once you're close to this, this fundamental limits, you know you can't get much better, which means it gives, that gives uh, confidence that you're doing the right thing. Um, but uh, yes, the, the community is is reaching those, those fun, uh, fundamental limits in, in um, making devices as efficient as they can be. Yeah. And is it going to get better? Well, can you advance uh, fundamental limits beyond the limit? I guess not. <laughs> well, look but, at look at the brain. You look have at, to you know, rethink it. <laughs> the brain is uses twenty watts of power. There's a lot of yeah. You know, wait, wait. There's a lot more that can be done. That is the issue. You know how much. You know how are you going to use that power? That is the fundamental yes. question. That's the algorithmic question, right? And so yeah. I think that there's plenty of things to, you know, to continue. Absolutely. There's plenty so I of think things one to be thing done. that's I think one thing that's happening, and this this goes back to my previous comment about how we're in this era of discovery where we're trying to extract all the information. <laughs> with very high SNR and continuous recording at high bandwidth and we want everything because we just need to mine the data. Um, but of course, this is not an energy efficient way to build our devices. In reality, if we deploy a brain machine interface, um, we're not necessarily gonna need every single bit of information. We're not gonna need to stream it out of the body constantly, right? We're gonna be much more intelligent about how we use the data that we acquire. And I think that's really going to drive uh, devices to be much, much lower power than what we're seeing today, which is all about just scale everything, you know, the get every electrode, get the largest number of electrodes recorded at full bandwidth, recorded at <laughs> ISNR. Um, you know, for example, there, a couple of years ago, there was a, a study published from from Stanford in Nature Biomedical Engineering where they, they did a, a primate reach task. And essentially what they did was they took their beautiful pristine recorded data and they said, okay, how, how badly can we record and still do what we're setting out to do just as well as we could do it? Um, 
And, and the answer was that they could, you know, decimate their, uh, their bandwidth by a factor of five, they could use half the number of bits that they actually recorded. And those kinds of things, understanding what it is we actually need to do with the signals is going to allow us to build devices with much, much, much lower powers. By the way, that's happening in the world of deep learning too, because uh, you know originally the 32-bit uh, weights and uh, much more, uh, you know, in terms of activity, it was all very high uh, power ba bandwidth uh, computing. But now what they're discovering is that once you have a network, you can actually download it. You can shrink it, download it, and uh, you only need five bits for the weights. And in, in fact, uh, this you can make you can create sparse activity so that you don't have to have a lot of information flowing uh, you know now they're using relus uh, which are rectified linear units which means that below threshold there's nothing coming out and if 95 percent of the neurons are below threshold that means that effectively the output is zero you don't have to multiply anything so it turns out you can actually it's just there it's just engineering specific uh you know uh, solutions to a particular problem whether you know it's ob object recognition speech recognition you can take it way down i mean it's 10 percent of what you, is being used for exploration um and and, and and ultimately actually what's happening now is that there's 100 companies out there who are building special purpose machine learning chips right you know and, and that reduces the power because they're, they're not general purpose but they can do you know vector multiplications much more cheaply and that's you know 90 percent of the computation that goes on so yeah, I, I, this by the way, this is a way that uh, progress occurs. Uh, you know, you have these. Uh, Kuhn had this book on you know scientific revolutions, and you have this some big jump in technology, and then there's normal science and technology, which is when you're making incremental advances, and and you're exploring and you're improving, 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 and that takes decades. By the way, it's not going to happen overnight. It, it really requires a lot of experience and a lot of improvements and so forth. But that, that's the way it's gone in the past. I don't see any reason why it's not going to be any different here. Okay, so uh, let's see, who, who, where are we in terms of uh, the, uh, let's see, I, I'd well, like to- We have another five minutes, uh, Terry, and it'll be great to have a, uh, a perspective a closing perspective from the IEEE brain community. So let me bring up the slides again here. Okay, okay, yeah, that's, that's a good time to uh, get back to the basics here. Okay, so, um, and in fact, let me also, um, take this opportunity to, to, um, uh, to thank uh, Atopy Brain for, for co-sponsorship. So, um, so the first meeting uh, was held, um, was sponsored by um, the by Atopy um, EMB, Engineering and Medicine Biology Society. Um, this was enjoined by, uh, by uh, uh, Institute of Neurocomputation. And uh, this was our first meeting that we had in 2019 um, at San Diego, because uh, UC San Diego. Uh, and so, um, so this year we have uh, uh, Brain present as, as a, a co-sponsor, and, and so this panel is, is highlighting some of the advances of uh, interdisciplinary brain research that is, is being spearheaded by this community, the general community. Um, and uh, let me just share my screen here. Right, so those are the participating societies. So clearly. Um, at a plea, EMB is, is one of the societies, but there are many others, and you have heard from all of them. In fact, uh, have you not heard from uh, any of the uh, societies here? So please uh, speak up uh, uh, over the last few minutes. Let me make sure you have the, the different perspectives here. Um, from the Electron Device Society uh, perspective, I, I do find that uh, the technology um, is, is still quite primitive. If you look at the, uh, I mean, you're basically, if you're talking about a cortical probe, it's a linear device. But the brain is three-dimensional for one. So are you really mapping how things are connected? Um, you're trying to interface what is essentially a silicon CMOS platform, which is just generally running about one volt to a, to a biological entity that is 
pretty much a, a less than 50 millivolts or on that, uh, the, that order. And if you put, are you talking about monitor, trying to figure out how the brain works where you're gonna put some uh, device in for a, a, a short period of time or a lab rat or so forth? Or are you trying to help a patient over long-term monitor them and, 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 um, and, 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 and modify their behavior or so forth? Um, so anything you implant, the body will eventually reject We'll start to create fibroids over it. So you're going to have to ratchet up your voltage or your sensing is going to go down. So, so do you want to go to a plastic? So I represent a, a wide range of electron devices. I work in plastic semiconductors and I also work in rigid uh, silicon and other rigid traditional semiconductors. So a lot of the organic semiconductors are more naturally cohabitating with or organic uh, materials. Um, Perhaps that. One of the things that I do here in Finland uh, is working with IoT type of applications where we're, we have so many of them that uh, we have to do energy scavenging from the environment. So you talk about energy. So we actively are making prototypes where they're scavenging energy from uh, light, heat, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, motion, all wide range. So we could think about self-powering these things, but there's still a disconnect in the rigid uh, electronics of the voltages, the power consumed. Um, you know, if you look, I saw a proposal the other day and it was talking about, you know, the the the, the chips that are being microprocessors and so forth that are being designed, they get more power hungry uh, and, and, and they get further away from the brain each generation rather than going the other way. Uh, there's a lot to be done um, uh, for, for all this. So whether it's materials or the devices, um, how do you do it remotely? Could you do it optically? Uh, does it have to be in contact? Um, there's a whole range of, of, of things uh, you have to, to be considered here. Thank you, Paul. Any more, uh, any other perspectives before we close here? I don't have a perspective, but I would like to invite you to invite your students to participate in the hackathon next year. It's yes. going to be next October. It's going to be in Prague, hopefully in person. Otherwise, we can always accommodate people online, uh, as we have done in the past. They cannot travel, even without pandemic, we have done that. And also to remind you to send your good papers and research results to, to the transactions on HMS. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you. And I think that is the bell for the uh, session. Uh, that, that was my phone, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, coincidence. Perfectly timed. <laughs> it is the bell. It is the bell. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, uh, Superi and entire panel. This was uh, was great. Uh, thank you. And that brings us to the closing of yeah. this event, uh, which has been an exciting uh, two-day event. Um, and uh, so we have, um, for the last uh, 20 minutes, we have both award presentations uh, and then some closing remarks. And uh, so Netesh or and uh, Marianne, uh, would you like to share your presentations? Right, I can show it either way. It would be simpler if you just did it because we'll go back and forth. Okay, very good. So, yes. so, yeah. so while Gert is putting up uh, for the audience, uh, there were, of course, a number of presentations and uh, students presented uh, posters and made live presentation. And I was sort of in charge of the posters and Mariam, she's there, she can speak up, was in charge of the live demonstration and presentations. And uh, I think they were all very lively and engaged. And I hope we do more of this in future. So, uh, I think in I fact, think sorry, before we have the um, uh, the Brain, Mind, Body uh, Awards, uh, we also have two awards. 
uh, that already had been conferred, uh, but so, so now they'll be officially conferred here. Those are IEEE Brain um, Awards um, for EMBS Best Papers, and those will be presented by uh, Jack and Paul, so Jack Egaunt and, and Paul Sadia. So Jack, if you're here, or Paul. Well, um, so on behalf of IEEE Brain and EMB, I, I can do it. Um, so do we have Antonio here? Yes, I'm here. Congratulations. So, uh, so on behalf you. of uh, both IEEE Brain, uh, Brain and EMB, so we're, we're delighted to, uh, uh, to present you this award for an IEEE Brain Best Paper Award. Uh, and this was in, in recognition of your uh, student uh, contest contribution uh, and being a finalist um, at the um, IEEE Engineering and Medicine Biology Society Conference, uh, which was held um, in November. And so this was your paper, Identification of Motor Unit Twitch Properties in the Intact Human in Vivo. So Antonio, Antonio Hernandez, uh, so congratulations. Thank you very much. And, and also thank you for organizing the, the symposium. So in this virtual world, we give you a virtual um, a prize, um, uh, but um, to, um, you can actually still um, anticipate to receive a check in the mail. And, and I believe it's a $500 uh, award. All right, thank you. Congrats again. Congratulations, Antonio. I'm sorry, Gert, I was here. Uh, it's just my computer would not let me unmute. So thank okay, you. Okay, okay. Thanks, yeah. Jack. Yes, please. Okay. So take over. Yes, Jack, please. Uh, can you advance to the next award? Because I don't have control. Yes, we're the next award, uh, Jack. Ah, so uh, that this is again from uh, um, the IEEE brain community. I'm sorry, Paul couldn't be here this afternoon. Um, we'd like to congratulate Shadi. Sartipi from the University of Rochester for the poster EEG emotion regulate recognition via graph-based spatiotemporal attention neural networks. Um, this was conferred at the IEEE Engineering and Medicine and Biological Society, EMBS, but uh, the award is uh, for the IEEE, from the IEEE brain community. So congratulations, Shadi. And thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for this uh, great event. And also I want to thank my co-authors for this paper. Uh, thanks a lot. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Jack. So that's it for the um, Atopoly Brain um, uh, Best Paper Awards. And so now we move to um, the actual um, awards for uh, this for this meeting. And so uh, we have Nitish and uh, Mariam will be uh, conferring the awards. Yes, so I, <laughs> I, I did get started. So our first one uh, is, uh, if I hope I'll pronounce correctly, Shaoshuao Sun at Columbia University. And uh, the poster was on EEG alpha synchronized repetitive TMS and as a non-invasive treatment for major depression uh, disorders. Uh, I think we were quite impressed by the full spectrum poster prepared with theory, experimental uh, results and overall foundations. Uh, we'll finalize all the signature and give you a real certificate, but congratulations. Congrats, yeah. Uh, is the student there? I guess not. Okay, and then, uh, you know, uh, the second prize then is shared by two students. So Leon uh, Lange's work uh, is on EEG and eye gazing decoding for aesthetic emotional arousal while viewing fine art. Uh, I thought we, we thought it was a very intriguing application of the techniques, multimodality techniques to interpret and perceive the reactions when you view fine art and it can be a window into many things. And I think that was a beautiful presentation. And so congratulations, Leon. If 
Is Leon here? Okay, well, certificate or money will be in the mail. Yeah. And uh, joint uh, second is to Daphina Sopi from US, uh, UCSD on modeling regulation of cortisol balance for stress resilience and improved mental health. And we are quite impressed by the theoretical rigor, the computational models of the control theoretic systems prepared. You know, the work lacked the experimental validation and outcome, but at least the model was based on prior data and work, uh, which was then further simulated by the student and the team. So once again, uh, Daphina, congratulations if you're there. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much for the award. And just want to give a shout out to my team and Professor Kauenbergs for their guidance and the TAs from the 122 class. And keep up the good work. Congratulations, good work. So now uh, this will go off to Mariam, who chaired the uh, demonstrations and uh, presentations. Yeah, so the uh, next uh, set of awards are for uh, the demo presentations. If we can go to the first slide on that. Do you have it? Okay. Oh, uh, can you share your screen, Mariam? Uh, I don't have it here. Oh, you. Okay, I inserted it in the Google slides that you sent. Right. Oh. Uh, I may have to refresh my. Um, yeah, if you refresh, um, it should be there. Wasn't it so much easier to walk onto the stage and pick up paper and actually? <laughs> oh, yes, it's there. Perfect. Yes. Now this is all virtual. <laughs> <laughs> this is real time. This is a real time workshop. <laughs> okay. All right. It's recorded. If, if, you, if you can't get it, I, I can. Uh... All right. It's here. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. You found it? Yes. Perfect. Um, just one second. Um... While that's happening, I do want to comment that there were a number of international students who were, have a lot of difficulty participated across really terrible time zone differences. And we want to show our appreciation for their attendance. Okay, continue. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the first, uh, the first award for the demonstrations goes to Akshay Paul from UCSD for their work on a 32 channel neural interface system on chip for low power, low noise electrophysiology. And all of the judges were pretty impressed by the system and its potential uh, for future implantable systems. So if Akshay is there, congratulations. Wow, thank you very much. This is truly an honor. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors, the co-developers of this chip, Kristen Fowler, Yu Chen Shu, uh, and of course our PI, uh, Gerd Kaumbergs. Um, indeed, there's huge potential for this, uh, and so we're all very excited to push the limits of implantable, low power, and also unobtrusive wearable electrophysiology. Congratulations again, keep up the good work. Okay, Thank so you. the next, uh, next, uh, next, the second uh, demo award goes to Lara, I think it's Heine Heineke um, from Mental Lab uh, for their work on Mental Lab Explore high precision wireless biosensor technology. And again, everybody was impressed by the potential uh, of this variable uh, sensor and what it can do for the future of BCI systems. So if Laura is there, congratulations, great work. She may not be because they're in Europe time zone, so I don't know. I think part of the mental lab team is still here, right? I'm not sure. Congratulations, great work. Yeah. And I think that concludes our uh, demo awards. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Mariam and Nitish. Thanks, Ian. Thank you for finding the support for these awards.
And with that, we're at the end of our meeting. And so um, uh, we have uh, Suboff uh, met in and uh, Terry gave us some final, um, so, some summary of the meeting and, and some uh, closing remarks. So, so Metin, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, it, this was a fantastic workshop and we really appreciate Gert for your leadership, what you have done. And of course, the including my society, ITOP MBS, as well as other societies, we are very keen to foster, promote the global brain neural engineering innovation, research and education. And we are uh, very aware of the urgent need for this development of these new technologies to monitor, control brain activity and disease. Just wanna go back to the, uh, the 2014. The first, right after the brain initiative, Paul and I, we had a very extensive discussion to really build a unique platform to really brainstorm the development of advanced technologies for brain. We're just simply interested how these technologies can be used to improve the lives of the humanity, as well as the, how we can increase awareness on the impact of the neurotechnology innovations, economy and society. These are the, in fact, the motto of the ITLP MBS, many other societies. Uh, advancing technology for humanity is the motto of the largest scientific organization in the world, I believe. So the, then 2019 and the brief discussion, Gert, Shankar and myself, we wanted to move into the next level, which means that to focus on more minimally invasive uh, strategies and the, as well as also to look at the cognitive neural engineering, natural intelligence, translation neural engineering for health and wellness. But the, uh, all the credit, should go to the GERP. I think he did a remarkable job in a short time and put this all this program. The future, the suggestion, I think, we will continue this workshop. This is sponsored by ITRP Engineering Medicine and Biology Society, co-sponsored by the Brain Initiative, Qualcomm, Cowley Institute of Brain, UC San Diego Brain, UC San Diego Bioengineering Department. I think it's very important to have it in, again, in the lovely city, uh, San Diego, face-to-face, -face, and I think this is a very, very important idea. We did not really to, uh, follow the instruction uh, provided by Gert. The melding brain and mind with body. I think this could be the, we should really think about the, the futuristic, how the uh, brain signal can be transferred to control the, uh, the, the patient in a remote location to better movement, there is lots of research on. I think it's good. It's going to be very interesting research area to look at. And the, finally, I would like to make that we should really increase the participation of the clinical, the uh, practitioners, and as well as the healthcare industry or neuro health care industry leaders to attending. And also, we need to have more uh, activities for the students in a way that is. Uh, the, for career advice for their uh, future. This is an amazing and a fascinating research area to really to bring them on board. And the, we also need to invite the, the uh, colleagues uh, early and mid career to also present their work and the, to have the, the panel discussion focus on the careers. I think this is the, the for futuristic. Wonderful to see all. And this is, uh, uh, it's going to really lead to another uh, the wonderful workshop in the near future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Metin, for all your leadership and for making this, this possible and starting this in the first place. It's great. Um, I think it's our pleasure. I just want to say the one more word that still is the early 2013 conference, 2003 conference in Capri Island. How much the email, how much the phone call uh, the, we receive, and the, I'm looking for these 200 plus people. Many students and the junior colleagues, they are full professors. They are institute directors. I think this, the building this very vibrant ecosystem, this platform, this workshop, really helps to shape up the next generation leaders. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matthew. And so Terry, now it's all yours for the last uh, few minutes. Well, okay, uh, I, I, I can tell you that uh, 
putting together a meeting like this really requires a tremendous amount of organization, coordination, resources, and uh, and uh, the the thirty uh, fourth annual NERX meeting was held last week, which uh, attracted seventeen thousand attendees. Um, you know, th this this whole field is is really shifting very rapidly under our feet, and so I want to talk about the future. Um, and where are we heading? We had a discussion on this just uh, within the with over the last uh, hour or so, and um, and someone said that uh, you know making predictions is very difficult, and as Yogi Berra once said, especially about the future. <laughs> In other words, we're not very good at it. Um, and I want to give you one example of, of you know when you introduce a new technology, I don't think we really it's very difficult to appreciate or imagine how it will play out and what impact it's gonna have on society. So back in the 1980s uh, and uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, we were using the internet for email and uh, between uh, universities, but it didn't go public until a little bit more, a little further into the 90s. And I, I want to think back and, and man, for those of you who were there, okay, could you have imagined the impact it was going to have on every aspect of your life and every business and, you know, social media, politics, you know, it, it's astonishing uh, what has happened, what's unfolded over the last 30 of, you know, years. Um, and it's still unfolding. And so, you know, the technology that we're building today and, and was being discussed here at this meeting, I think has potential for being just as transformative as the internet was. Why? Because we're, we're dealing, we're talking about how people communicate with each other and how they, uh, their body interacts with the world. And that really it opens up a whole new uh, worlds of uh, experiences and uh, benefits, you know, for people with disabilities, uh, cognitive appliances to help people, you know, having trouble with their memory. Uh, it goes on and on and on. And, and I just want to comment uh, uh, on Metton's uh, pointing out that the, you know, in, in our uh, panel discussion, which was, uh, let me just read it. Uh, Oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. Uh, melding mind and body in the age of the brain. Well, you know, what, what that brought to my mind was uh, something out of uh, Star Trek, the Vulcan mind meld. Does everybody re remember that? You know, the, you know, <laughs> for those of you who are Trekkies. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's uh, it's actually may become a reality. I mean, uh, this is where you know Jack uh, Gallant, uh, who was on our panel, has has pioneered something called uh, you know, mind reading. You know, with fMRI, if you've calibrated a machine learning algorithm, you can pretty much reconstruct what they're looking at. You know, in the visual responses of of the fMRI, and uh, people are beginning to do the same thing with language. Uh, this is work with ECOG that's being done at UC Berkeley uh, and elsewhere. Uh, you know, you you can with, you can actually take what they're thinking, not what they're saying, but what they're thinking. You know, the, the words that they're thinking about, and actually make them real, as if they're being spoken and understandable. And so, if you could do that, now you know all you have to do is to connect one brain to the other. <laughs> Uh, you know, we have electrodes in one brain that is the information is coming out and then another brain where it's going in. And, uh, you know, that might actually, you know, it, it's, not, it's not too outlandish. I think uh, these are just random thoughts, but it's, you know, what really happens uh, is always much more uh, amazing and interesting than you could imagine. And, and, and that's really what we are, I think, facing. Uh, the other thing that uh, I wanted to point out is that the hardware technology is really critically important, right? Not just the software stuff, but the the actual 
nuts and bolts of, of how you how you have stable recordings, how how you're able to maintain maintain long term contacts. And I was encouraged by the fact that uh, <laughs> we heard about plastic transistors, mm -hmm. right? Um, how wonderful is that, right? To have plastic transistors, right? So, you know, th th these are the new technologies that are coming online that, that are gonna make possible all of the, the, the future for this field, for uh, being able to help uh, patients, you know, that have the very, uh, bad uh, you know, disorders from, you know, from raging from Parkinson's you know to strokes and so forth but more but and and and, and then helping uh, a society in terms of uh, being able to uh, uh, communicate communicate better and be able to uh, understand uh, you know cross languages you know the, the Google translate again okay okay let's go back to Star Trek uh, no, this is this is you know the uh, <laughs> universal language translator. You remember the handheld? You know, Captain Kirk would hold this thing in his hand. It looked like a <laughs> microphone. <laughs> remember this? And and you know, it would translate between languages. And I kind of laughed and said, "Well, you know, not not in my lifetime." But it's here. We <laughs> have your cell phone, the <laughs> universal language translator. <laughs> I was in China a while back. Now this is like two three years ago now, and I wanted to order a ham sandwich, and you know the the the, the and I couldn't speak any Chinese and she couldn't speak any English. And so I, I, you know, in, I said into the phone, you know, I'd like a ham sandwich and it came out, you know, long, long, and, you know, and start Chinese. And I said, what the heck is going to come back? You know, and it was a ham sandwich. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really uh, science fiction, but it's real. This has become real. And we're living through this time right now, which is very extraordinary because we're, we're going to create the future. So thanks everyone who's put, their time and effort into this wonderful, uh, you know, feast that we've had for the last two days. And also uh, think about the future because really this is what is, we're gonna be shaping. And, and there's a lot of issues that have to be thought through very carefully about how the technology is gonna be used. So thanks everybody and uh, good luck wherever you are. Thank you so much for this wonderful speakers, panel speakers, uh, panelists, uh, organizers, uh, poster chairs, poster uh, the presentation chairs, live demonstrations. It was an amazing job they have done. Thank you so much again. Thanks everyone for participating. And we'll see you again next year. Um, next year. Not too, and the next year is not too far from now, but so in December 2020. Too. We, we hope to see you. We'll see. We we'll hope to see you in person in San Diego, or hybrid. Uh, we can either way. Uh, either way, how we, we can join up. Thank you. Just a bit of heads up. It's possible IEEE neural engineering may well be in Baltimore, so we could do East Coast West Coast. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's not. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, good. Bye, East Coast. Bye, West Coast.